during the course of this convention, which is today and tomorrow, will be amazing. You don't want to miss any bit of it. So please get the writing material, get your pen, get your notepad, make sure you take down notes because indeed, before you are able to understand the vision, you must write down the things that you are going to learn here today. However, um, we are also going to be looking forward to, you know, the ministrations from uh, the Continental Pastor, and that is the Pastor J.F. Odeshola, and also his assistant, Pastor Boniface Okenwa, will be here for us and with us during this convention. Also, we'll be privileged to have the ministry of the Intercontinental Youth Pastor of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. And that is the person of Pastor Belemina Obunje. But of course, for today, we're going to kickstart with something exciting. But as children of God that we are, we cannot be up in anything without prayers. And so it would be my privilege to hand over at this point to the country coordinator, RCCG Talking Mission, and the special assistant to the continental overseer on Europe, RPCG Africa 3 continent. And that is the person of Pastor Olagoke Ajayi as he takes us on the opening prayer. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We bless the name of God for this wonderful opportunity. And I believe that God of heaven, who has made today a reality, would bless every one of us in Jesus' name. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, the King of glory, the Lord of Lord, we appreciate you, we thank you, we bless you for this awesome time, awesome moment in your presence. Father, please accept our thanks in the name of Jesus. We commit this program Amen. right now. Holy Spirit divine, please have your way in the name of Jesus. Lord God of heaven, every Amen. children that you have arranged to speak to us today, let your grace and your anointing rest upon them. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Heavenly Father. We bless your holy name. We cover this platform with the blood of Jesus. We pray that more than what we have prepared for, you will visit us today in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We worship your holy name. For in Jesus' most wonderful name, we are praying and we declare this program open in the name of God the Father and of Amen. the Son and of the Amen. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much, Pastor Olagoke Ajayi. Thank you very much for leading us in uh, that short but, uh, you know, precise and direct prayers. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> Worldwide, even as you're watching us right now, it is still the RCCG Africa 3 Continental Youth Convention. Yep, and my name is LG, and it is a great privilege for me to be here and connect with every one of you worldwide. Again, I'd like to let you quickly know the importance of you having a notepad and a pen, because you need to, you know, as a lot of young people say, jot things down so you can take things away. Yep, because there's so much to unpack for this year's convention. There is value beyond what you can measure. There is going to be uh, anointing. There's going to be impartation. Even uh, if nobody may be touching you physically, by the virtue of your heart, all right, and your head being in this convention, you are about to be immensely blessed. Um, but even as we go on, don't forget to invite your friends. Don't forget to share this link with as many people as possible, okay? Because the more, the merrier. And the reason why we are not afraid of more, of more people joining us, is because our God is able. He's able to indeed bless every single person that we bring in. But then for today, we are going to start with um, a talk show. So, yeah, a talk show. You're going to be listening, and um, you're going to be taking down notes. However, I need to let you know so that we can make the best out of this talk show. We're going to start by uh, our, our speakers, our talk show panelists, that is. They will be making an opening presentation. All right. From their opening presentation, you can prepare to ask your questions. You can put your questions down, drop it in the comment section of whatever platform you're watching on. 
Facebook, Zoom, or YouTube. Drop your questions there, and I'm sure that the moderators behind the scenes will pick the questions, and it will get to me so that I'll be able to ask our panelists. All right? Now, when our panelists are speaking, I charge you, I beseech you, brethren, to listen so that you'll be able to ask appropriate and absolutely relatable uh, questions. Now, for today, the first segment that we're starting with, which is the talk show, will be on career and relationship, all right? It will be on career and relationship. And I'm going to tell you why I'm greatly excited about it, because I think these are the two most important things that young adults and youth are faced with worldwide. And it appears to be a, 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 a pivotal stage of our lives when we want to get career right and when we want to get relationship right. Okay, either the relationship of or considering who to marry, or we actually want to get married. So, ladies and gentlemen, in fact, if you are single, this is where you should get your your partner, your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Yeah, get them in. All right, get them to come and listen to what you're listening to, so that they can be as blessed as you are. Okay, um, so quickly, I will be welcoming our uh, our panelists and. Um, our panelists today who will be speaking on career is uh, the wonderful, I usually refer to her as um, E for Energy, because she is one of the youngest uh, wave-making uh, practitioners in the global energy sector, all right? I know a lot of us uh, may find that surprising. She's a leading lady. She's an inspiration to me personally and to a lot of other young adults and youth worldwide. So believe me, if you're a part of the RCCG Africa Three Continental Youth Convention, you're blessed because the person that will be on that panel that I'm talking about this morning is uh, a manager at Schlumberger and, uh, in Nigeria. She's a product manager, if I get that right. Ladies and gentlemen, that person is none other than Mervyn Azeta. Mervyn Azeta. Marina Zeta will be uh, speaking on career, and she will be uh, she will be speaking on uh, on career. She will be talking to us on career, and um, I hope I hope that we are going to have uh, questions. And also on relationships, on relationships, we are going to be having uh, our very own beloved Pastor Adeyemo. Pastor Diemo will be speaking to us on relationship. So uh, quickly, I'll start with, uh, uh, with Marin Azeta. Um, Marin, good morning. LG, thank you very much for having me. A very good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. It's uh, terrific to be participating in this event and to be speaking alongside some of the most respected um, individuals and pastors in the Redeemed Christian Church of God, I'm deeply appreciative of Pastor Keazo and his team for putting this event together and for inviting me. And thanks to all of you who have joined the event as well, whether in person or virtually. I pray that God will bless all of us and increase us in knowledge and wisdom as we you know, participate in this event for his glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've been asked to speak on careers. But I thought that it would be great to speak on careers in energy because there's just so many opportunities for young people today in the energy sector, considering what the world is facing with respect to getting energy to our homes, um, especially because there are like over 600 million people, particularly in Africa, who do not have access to energy. There are also over a million people in the world who are lacking access to energy today. And over 2 million people are relying, relying on, you know, um, dirty cooking um, sources for their food across the world, but mostly in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. So I guess the best place to start today is to ensure that we all have an understanding of what the energy industry is. This so in those is being recorded. As I establish a few truths about the energy industry. So the very first truth I wanted to establish is the fact that the energy industry is a complex, capital-intensive, and cyclical industry. It's also very competitive. Um, so remember those four Cs, complex, capital-intensive, cyclical, and competitive. 
But the world cannot do without the energy industry. And why? In simple terms, it's the heartbeat of the world. It has fundamentally shaped the lives and future of billions for decades. And as a matter of fact, from time immemorial, I often say that the energy industry is not, uh, the energy industry did not start, you know, when they found oil in 1859 or even with the industrial revolution that we know took place in the 18th century. No, it actually began on the first day of creation. And some of you may be wondering, how is that? Because of course, God said, let there be light. And light, you'll agree, is a form of energy, right? And throughout history, we've seen the use of light, the use of oils and all of those things. Even the 10 virgins had to go to a market to buy the oil for light. So energy has been there. There's been an energy market from as long as possible. Um, number two, it's afforded us and will continue to afford us the feedstock for the devices you use. So basically the electricity you need to power your devices. It's afforded us materials for several other industries. It's afforded us tools that are very integral to our daily lives. The lights in our homes, internet access, you know, and a bunch of things. Um, if you are, if you are having to be in that, in the, if you're having to attend this physically, I'm sure you probably had to take a vehicle or something to that place. So it powers those vehicles. It provides the fuels for vehicles. It provides the energy you need to keep your food cool or preserved for as long as possible. And even when you're in a warm uh, climate it helps you keep your uh, air conditioners on. So it's there to help us daily. It's, it's a very important part of our lives. And beyond all of those other things, you know, the energy industry has been a pivotal driver of economic and industrial growth across the world. Number three, it has evolved with time to incorporate multiple other sectors and even industries. So including, you know, the building industry, the refining industry, the power industry. So a lot of things are involved across the energy sector from production to the transportation of energy to even the consumption of energy in our homes or the sale and supply of energy generally. So just to reiterate, it's not limited to oil and gas extraction, as a lot of people tend to believe, or renewables, like a lot of people are getting very excited about solar, wind, and all that stuff. Very good, but the energy industry is not only uh, limited to those. In its entirety, the energy industry contains as many things, refining, utilities of power, coal industry, manufacturing, mining, transport, constructions like roads and buildings, all of those. Number four, it's a regulated market. It doesn't operate on its own. It's somewhat controlled by governments and it has multiple stakeholders playing in there. You have the private sector, which are like investors or developers or companies like mine, Slumberger, and as many other companies that are working in the energy sector to deliver energy access to millions around the world. It includes the civil, um, civil society, like non-governmental organizations and international organizations like the World Energy Council, um, you know, the UN energy program or uh, environment program, all of those things. Um, sustainable energy for all from the UN as well. Um, the IEA. So all of those, IEA is International Energy Industry. All of those are stakeholders in the energy industry. But then you also have citizens like you and I, you know, we're consuming energy, we're buying. So if we're not naturally buying and, and, and participating in that industry, it would not naturally thrive. So at the end of the day, we all are stakeholders of the energy industry. Whether you're working there or not, you're a stakeholder. Number five, it's a dynamic, fascinating and rewarding industry to work in. I've enjoyed working in it over the last nine years. Um, but then it's important that you know that it requires long hours of work. Um, sometimes it often exposes us to extreme risky conditions or situations, but I love it because there are a lot of procedures and you know precautionary measures that you can take to keep yourself safe. So if you're following the rules, if you're doing the right things, if you're as situationally aware, to identify things if you're strategically thinking to, 
to think about like what's gonna happen if i do this um okay could i do this thing else to save myself and to keep my my colleagues safe a lot of things if you're actually engaging your mind before engaging your hands on anything you will be safe and you would you would excel in the industry um another reason why i love the industry is because no two days are the same for me right there's always one new challenge there's always one thing or the other that you need to address and that is exciting because it creates opportunity for me to learn and to grow and to make impact i think that impact piece is pretty important as well so you're not just necessarily just there uh making money and doing your job we also thinking about ways to create value for the organization for the industry where your organization is playing and just create an impact for even your communities or you know like people around you um the industry has become even more interesting now with the fourth industrial revolution i'm sure a lot of you've heard about ir 4.0 or industry uh, 4.0 and then the energy transition there's also something called the energy transition which is pretty much presenting a dual challenge to the energy industry the need to meet energy demands without impacting the atmosphere or the environment so amidst all the climate realities these other two pieces like the industrial revolution and the energy transition are presenting a lot of opportunities to do amazing things uh, they're also inspiring the need to design to develop new cleaner and smarter technologies and to progress on that journey um, of moving to a low carbon um, resilient and sustainable future for all so to get into the energy to get into the energy industry, there are several tracks. Um, and I was going to highlight those tracks to you just so that you can understand that. It's not necessarily requiring people who have engineering or generally STEM degrees, but you can actually work in the energy industry with whatever degrees you've got, whatever qualifications you've got. Um, so the first track is technical. Clearly, you have to draw in or bring in engineers or scientists or technologists or mathematicians because we need all of these people with their technical skills to drive some of the things that we're doing in the energy sector so you have people who will be working in the lab or working in the field working in the lab in terms of research or working in the field like designing and deploying those tools um, for energy projects across the world or infrastructure projects across the world as well you have sales and marketing, um, and these guys will be responsible for connecting customers, you know, selling the products that we develop. So when we have new technologies, of course, we need to sell it to the customers that we're going to be deploying them for. So you're going to have people who are going out there, connecting with these customers, helping them see the value that these technologies will bring and encourage them to purchase or invest in them. And then these would deliver profitable growth to our companies as well. You have the policy bit, um, which encourage and understanding the trends and directions of the market to educate you know, policymakers or even companies and governments around the world to do the right things to progress. Again, on that journey to a low carbon energy future, you have people who may not necessarily have the technical backgrounds like, you know, engineering or scientific uh, degrees, but they're able to understand, to know how the market works and possess marketable skills as well. And then you have the legal um, track which is for defining operating rules, lecture, and monetary regulatory co compliance across the industry. You also have this very new one called sustainability, which looks at the engagement um, with the environment. It has actually been there for quite a while, but there's a new piece in terms of how we deliver global stewardship across the globe as across the industry as well. So they're looking at managing those services and looking at impact assessment, minimizing workplace ac accidents, conducting regular evaluations to ensure that compliance is being met and then making any necessary improvements to pro progress. 
So the range of jobs is truly immense. Um, and for whatever pathways you choose, you would have the potential to contribute or influence the future of energy. And having said that, how do you get in? So I thought I would share that as well. So you can get into the energy industry by, um, you know, going on to university to take uh, or pursue a course in STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and maths. So you can maybe go study chemical engineering like I did, um, or even sustainable energy futures like I did in my second degree. So any of those focused education for the energy sector, you can take that. And with that, you have a gateway into the energy industry. You can also get in by way of internships, um, and these expose you to the technical aspects of the industry and provide opportunities for you to develop and own your analytical thinking skills, um, your communication skills and problem solving skills. So the energy industry really does require high level cognitive skills because there are a lot of challenges, like I mentioned earlier, and you will be required to help fix some of those challenges. Um, internships also enhance your employment prospects and they give you an advantage to advance within any company that you may have chosen. Then you have apprenticeships as well. Apprenticeships are focused programs to bring in people who are hands on in terms of, you know, helping with maintaining, operating and, you know, um, fixing whatever issues may be have happening with any of the equipment or technologies that we have within the industry. And then you have partnerships and volunteering. So you can decide to volunteer for an energy organization and with time you become a part of that organization. Or perhaps you're an investor, you have money, you want to invest in an energy startup. By virtue of partnering with someone who is you know, driving that startup, you can be a stakeholder and player in the energy industry as well. Lastly, when you do get into the energy industry or whatever other careers that you choose, it's important that you ensure that your work is ordered according to the plans and priorities that God has given to you. So it's important that you, you know, spend some time asking God what he would have you do as a Christian, because, again, you don't want to just dabble into things and waste time. We don't have all the time in the world to play around. So we need to be a bit more intentional and, you know, focused. Uh, we need to have our motivations right and doing the right things and making sure that we're maximizing the time that God has given to us in this world. So find out from God what his plans and priorities for your careers are, and then try to order whatever work you're doing with that or in line with that. Um, you must focus on pleasing him. Um, because again, you might have many bosses or you might have managers or supervisors or leaders like that, team leaders, whatever, but God is the real boss. So it's important that you please him in whatever you do and bring him honor through your career pursuits, whatever it is that you're doing. Just make sure that God is at the center of that and he's pleased because when He is pleased, he will certainly continue to give you the grace, the strength, and the wisdom to navigate whatever challenges may come, especially those four seeds that I told you about at the start. So if you are, you know, pleasing God with your work, he would release the grace, the wisdom, the strength, everything else that you need to navigate those and to thrive in your careers. So thank you so much. I look forward to the questions. Wow, beautiful one there, Mervyn. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, before uh, we get to the questions, I need to let you know that um, that your, your presentation was filled with energy. Yeah, so the E for energy, really, is a valid one uh, for me to call you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Um, I already have some questions coming in, but I won't be asking you now. Uh, before we come to asking you these questions, I'd like us to take the opener from... Uh, our facilitator today who will be speaking on relationships so ladies and gentlemen uh you seen that we started well on a very very high note and believe me by the grace of god we are not going any lower than we already started so we're going to welcome pastor adeyemo to give us his opener uh for this talk show on relationship pastor adeyemo over to you sir <coughs> Thank you. 
So meanwhile, please, while we wait for Pastor Adiemo, ladies and gentlemen, viewers worldwide, please endeavor to put your questions together for Mervyn. Okay, that is why we are not taking the questions now. We have some already, but I know that some of us may be ruminating over what she has said, and we can put those questions together and send it in. They will get to her. She's on standby. She's not rushing anywhere. Uh, so, Pastor Adiemo, we will take your opener now. No, not here, there. Okay. Uh, I'm sure you can hear me now. Absolutely. We can hear you, sir. Please go ahead. Oh, good. Uh, thank you. So it's good to have me. Uh, thank you to the leadership of the youth. And um, it's always a pleasure to come on board like this and uh, learn from the youth because uh, we are youth forever as well. And um, appreciation, appreciation to the uh, to Mervy for those energetic um, energy, um, you know, discussion. Uh, for a few of us in the industry, we know how, um, how, how much the industry is needed now in the world. And um, I just like you said, uh, the, there's no limit to what someone can become. So far, it makes God is uh, uh, number one. Now, I'll be talking on relationship, and I, I believe that uh, just like we have in Genesis 2.18, uh, God said it's not good for man to be alone. So, uh, why that is not enough reason to rush into marriage? It's a good reason for someone to decide and say, I'm going to be getting married at some point in my life. And since God is the one that said it's not good to be alone, it only means that God is saying it's good to be married. You know, he said, whoever finds a wife finds a good thing and has obtained favor in the sight of the law. Now, why that is what the Bible says, is that someone also stop a sister from walking down to the pastor and say, Daddy, I've been praying, and this is what God is telling me. What I think societally is not correct for us, and even as a uh, uh, member of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, is for you to walk down to your brother and say, Hey, brother, I've received you. But I think there's enough uh, premises for you to get that done without being uh, uh, un uncultured, you know. Walk to the pastor, walk to the wife, and say, Pastor, this is what the Lord is telling you. You know, so that's about that. Uh, you will discover that we have a perfect example of God making a wife for uh, Adam in the beginning of the Bible. And you will see that it was, uh, it was uh, effortless. Adam on his part was even sleeping. He woke up and found a wife. But the wife God provided uh, was a wife that God decided that uh, was an help meet for him. And so that takes us to the fact that uh, God always makes sure that it's an help meet for you and he can always arrange that for you. So how do you find that? Yes, I'm there. If you, to, if you go to Genesis 24, you will discover that when Abraham wanted to have a, a wife for Isaac, he went for the trusted Eliezer and gave Eliezer certain discussion, you know. Eliezer, he had so many people around him. But he listens, he, 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 he relied on the leader. You also have a lot of people around you, your parents, your friends, your pastor, everyone, but you have the Holy Spirit. And you have to rely on the Holy Spirit to guide you on who to marry. Uh, let me pause here and say, if someone gets it right at the point of choice, you will definitely get it right in your marriage. Almost 90% of the problem is solved while you are still a youth why you are deciding on who to marry. So if you get that right at that point, every other thing will be right. Why? Because at some point, you know, in the journey of marriage, there will be issues coming up. But you will always be remembering your better how God told you, how God gave you the wife and stuff like that. And then you will be able to move on. You know, or the husband as well. <laughs> Not just the wife. Maybe your spouse. That's the best way to put it. Now, uh, and that takes us to the fact that you need to be an individual who has been hearing God on other issues of life, just we've been told now, if you are studying law and you want to think about energy law for your master, you need to go back to God. Not because Mary says so, you know. So not because pastor said, this is a good lady, this is a good brother, but what has the Holy Spirit said? Now, as you know, the Holy Spirit is the one talking. You must have been hearing him before. The great Samuel didn't even know God was talking, you know. He took Eli, which everybody thought was finished, 
to say, hey, Samuel, that's God talking there. So you must be so familiar with the Holy Spirit in other aspects. And I would say as you, you, you know, some of the things people run after you to tell you your hairstyle is not good, you can't wear that kind of dress. Why don't you just, uh, you know, take a step further and, uh, and, 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 and just be the one to ask the Holy Spirit. Dress up and stand in front of your mirror and tell the Holy Spirit, what do you think? Let the Holy Spirit tell you about little, little things. And then suddenly, the issue of who to marry doesn't become a big thing again because you can always ask the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you from experience. When we're leaving the college, somebody asked, you know, they were doing the final year, brethren, uh, uh, program to, to ease us out of the place. And we're having the event, you know, in Nipper. And one sister said, well, concerning Brasso, several times we saw him on campus, but he, he behaved as if he never saw us. You know, he would just walk away. Sometimes we, then I said, I'm so sorry. Um, 100% of those times, I didn't see you. But what would have led to that could be many. One, I could have been busy. Then two, you know, why am I looking at you when I've asked God as soon as I enter the fellowship and I feel, because I entered university as an adult, I was 21. So I asked God in the fellowship, is my wife here? And he said, no. So <laughs> what am I looking, you know? So we do normal fellowship in, but it doesn't go beyond that, you know? So when I go to when I will serve, I asked God, is my wife here? He said, yes. I asked sisters around me that were close to me. Then I began to ask him, is he booking? He said, no. Is he talking? No. Is he the other talking? No. So who is it? I will show you. You know, so, and where did I find my wife? Where uh, the wife of Isaac found him? Because she was busy working. And as it showed up, I mean, Eliezer showed up rather. You know, so uh, we were at the fellowship. We were having programs. And then, uh, can you see hear me? I had a sound. So, you know, we were at the fellowship and then we were having uh, outreach. And they said, hey, worry, brethren, uh, they're giving you bread somewhere that sharing bread for you. So I went there to collect my bread. And when I stretched my hand to collect the bread, Holy Spirit said, that is your wife. I said, I bind. Okay, so that perishing in so called my wife. How can how do they link? It doesn't link. <laughs> but it's 31 years now that we've been married because that's my wife. You know, so we must be people who are, are busy working for God, who make God first, who have decided that, you know, I'm a child of God. I'm not going to follow the way of the world. If you look at Genesis 34 clearly, there are a lot of lessons there. You know, in verse number, uh, can we go there? Genesis 34, pardon me. Uh, I think uh, we'll read the Bible. Genesis 24, verse number 4. It says, but thou shalt go on to my country. So if you don't like going to a fellowship, who's going to marry you? Now we have the youth program now. You are a brother, you are a sister. You're too big to join us because you work in some best places. Because you work in some of the best places. And so you, you can't join us here. What's going on? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Please go on, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, you know, as a child of God, you need to choose a wife from your people. I'm a member of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, and I will say the first set of your people are the members of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. Why? Because you feed from the same pot. I've heard people say, what does it matter where I marry? I'm a child of God. I can marry anywhere. I've heard people say so. But I've also heard men of, men of God, places where you didn't bother, where you would have loved to marry from. I've heard men of God of such places saying, nothing is wrong with um, uh, masturbation. So if you have a man of God that says nothing is wrong with masturbation and you've married from such a place, get ready for a shocker. You know, when somebody married an unbeliever, the devil is his in-law. So you cannot uh, separate what your spouse has learned over time with how the behavior will be in marriage. So say, go to my people, and I'm encouraging you to stay with your people. Don't just be a church attendee. Make sure you have a fellowship where you are. You know, Make sure in the church you also have a fellowship. 
one department, the other department, youth have a program, be part of it, and God will bless us in Jesus' mighty name. The other one I want to say is that get matured, especially the brothers among us. It's not sufficient that uh, you are mature in age alone. You need to be mature also in disposition. Because one day they're going to tell you, you know, you're not going to die before your father-in-law anyway. So one day they're going to bring the news to you that your father-in-law is dead. So when your wife is crying, you shouldn't be crying with her. You should be able to handle it. So if you are not emotionally balanced, soon as they're saying they may terminate people in the office, you are the first to stop eating at home. You know, you are the first to be depressed. So if a man gets depressed quickly over every story that God has taken care of, he is not mature. So be mature. I would rather say that as well. It's as important as, you know, having age and resources in your disposal. If you look at, as I'm trying to pause now, if you look at um, Eliezer, he told them, God has blessed my master. The master I was talking about that is Abraham. And everything Abraham had belonged to Isaac. Now, if you say you can marry anywhere, that's fine. Ishmael also married anywhere. But he was not a son of promise. We are people of destiny. We are people of promise. And we have you know, to follow the way of God. Now, a uh, final thing that I want to say before I leave is that who do you frolic with? Because you're going to end up among the people you see every time. You know, and you can remember what uh, the Bible says, that we should not yoke ourselves with unbelievers. You're going to ask everybody who is married. They go marry among the people they meet frequently. So who are those people you are meeting frankly, frequently? Drop a dot on the paper. Put a circle around it. Write the name of every opposite sex around that circle. One of them may end up being your spouse, if you're a sister. And if you're a brother, just put, I mean, put the opposite sex in that circle. One of them behind up becoming your, your spouse. Why? Because these are the people you see all the time. You know, so when I see people saying, I'm not joining PSF, I'm not going for youth meeting, who do you want to marry? You marry one nice guy. Nice guys are those ones who give ice cream to people. They are very nice. They buy you ice cream. They buy something for you from Dubai. They order things for you. But they are not born again. They are not of your father's household. They feed from a different pot. For example, we don't eat pork in our house, not because I ate it, but because my parents never cooked it. So feed from your mother's pot. So it's important for you to frolic with the kind of people that you know, if I end up with any of this, I don't have problem. I'm happy. So guide that jealously, and the Lord will help us in Jesus' mighty name. Now, final word, please. If you have seen who to marry, I advise you, for the sake of decency, there are leadership. If the pastor carry fire in his eye, as they say, the youth leader does not. Uh, the minister in charge of youth normally is always a youth-friendly fellow. Let the person know what you're planning. Let them know. Otherwise, you end up telling someone, I want to marry you. We know the fellow is married already or is engaged. Don't be embarrassed. Go to them and say, this is how God is leading me. And that is the doctrine of this church anyway. And don't forget, the Bible says that uh, elders who labor both in words and, in words and doctrine, they are due for double honor. So you will never remove the place of doctrine. You say who you want to marry, go tell your man of God. Don't, don't, don't just go around and uh, you know, start talking to this. He said no, you talk to that. He says no. And the first one come back and say, I'm saying yes now. So how many years will you take? You know, so I, I will stop that. But don't forget what I said. If you get it right at the point of choice, which is not rocket science, you will get it right in your marriage. How do you get it right at the point of choice? Know how to hear from the Lord. You must hear from the Lord on career, on this, on that, on that, before you go into marriage. Because those other ones I mentioned are things you can say, I'm not interested in. You can start a business and stop. But if you start a marriage and you stop, people will laugh at you. Jesus Christ also says so. Who is that man that want to build a house that will not first of all cost it and see whether he can complete what he started so that his friend does not laugh at him. We will not become laughing stocks in Jesus' name. God bless you. Wow. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Adeyemo. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, that, 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 was, uh, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. And um, you, you can bet it, sir. That we have questions for you already. And sir, those questions are tough. They thank are you, tough. sir. Right? I'll be here. Okay, thank you very much. Of course. Thank you very much for your encouragement that you're going to be here. That um, if we, no matter the question we ask you, 
your network will not disappear before you answer us. And yeah. not at all. I'm using two systems. Uh -huh. so we see how Beautiful. I that time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very nice. Well done, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. So now, Mervyn, Mervyn, um, again, thank you for uh, what you've done, uh, what you've shared with us. Uh, I mean, I see a lot of people taking down uh, notes uh, uh, on on the four skis. So, Mervyn, I have a question for you this morning. When you say the energy industry is a cyclical industry, what, what, what do you mean by that? Okay, so um, if you have been following what has happened in the world uh, last maybe 10 years, for example, you would see doing the industry is quite influenced by the price of oil or the price of gas. So when the price of oil is down, you know, businesses try to adjust and perhaps they can of the energy industry or the volatility of the energy industry and so they always worry that uh they don't want to get into a place where you know very quickly they can dispose you <laughs> or they can bring you on um it's quite impacted with a lot of the things that are happening in the world so it could be impacted by the price of oil it, it could also be impacted by weather conditions right so think about renewables for example if you have designed your business around the need or the availability of sunlight and for some reason <laughs> there, there's no sun um let's say it's raining 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 there's a chance that your business will be somewhat impacted because it's not going to be generating um as much electricity as you would you would want similarly for wind um generation if there is not enough wind or the speed is not enough to power those wind turbines then you have a, a challenge as well right and then if there is an earthquake or there is a flood um and it disrupts your elect electricity infrastructure that's it right and then you'd have to find a way to build on um perhaps you know drive that for the people who are working there at the time there's not a chance that you know we get paid for for work that you're not necessarily doing or you're not for the value that you're not necessarily creating at the time. So it's somewhat impacted by those things and it can keep going up and down, up and down, up and down, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mervyn. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Adeyemo a question. No, Mervyn, I'm not done with you, please. All right, but I'm going okay. to ask Pastor Adeyemo <laughs> a question. Yes, because I want uh, our interaction to be dynamic. And so no matter what yeah. area our, our audience is interested in, they, I mean, every question is valid. So, <clears throat> Pastor Diemo, thank you very much for what you shared with us today. And, uh, I mean, your emphasis on if you, if you get it right at the point of choice, you know, um, you, you have a whole lot of things going well for you from there. Um, I have a question. Does God choose your spouse for you? I mean, is there that one particular person yeah. that you must, I mean, if you don't marry this particular person, you're done for. So is, is, is that true? Is that true? No, 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 it's not true. Uh, because, you know, if you remember, we are spirit, soul, and body. So we have power of choice. We should only make sure that we are guided. I mean, for example, uh, don't forget that even in the book of Psalms, he said, it granted them the desires of their heart, but it brought leanness to their soul. So, uh, I mean, God is never going to force anyone to do anything. So, there's no particular, for me, I mean, for a brother, there's no particular lady that if you don't marry this lady, then you are finished. No, no. But where the point is, is this. You must be asking God, God, do you, you know, there must be a lot of people that you can marry, but God must be the one guiding you, you know. Otherwise, if you say someone you want to marry the person, it's so clear that this woman you should be marrying, and the person says no. I mean, how again are you able to marry? That means that there's no particular person fixed that you must marry. And if you don't marry that person, you're going to have a problem. No. The first common denomination is that this is a child of God. After the fellow is a child of God, you need to ask God. God, I know it, it seems that this one will make a good spouse, but what do you think, sir? You know, because he's God and it's your father, you know, so you will be able to interact with him. And then you will know that this is what God told me before I started. <coughs> 
Okay. I don't know what I thank you. Uh, that. Yes, 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 yes. But just for you to uh, uh, to give it a little bit of uh, clarity, uh, someone yeah. was wondering uh, that. Um, Okay, that it has been said, they've heard it severally, and then they just want you to give some credence or debunk it, however it okay. is, that uh, God does not uh, choose a spouse for Christian. I mean, that God doesn't choose a spouse for uh, Christian. So, yes, so, so, so yeah, I, 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 want you, I want you to touch that. Let, let's, let's put it this way. I actually love to use um, clock. I, yeah, use, I, love to use, I love to use the clock, the hands of the clock. If you look at the hands of the clock, if you have both of the hands of the clock up there, that's 12 noon or, or 12 midnight, whatever. That's 12. Am I right? So I'm not sure that that's the way to get a wife because you're not going to marry an angel. Both hands can be up there. They can be up there. Now, if you put both hands down here, you're not of this world. You need to hear from God as well. Now, we're now left with put one hand up, one hand down. Which hand? I would rather you put the shorter, I mean, the longer hand up and the shorter hand down. You don't close your eyes when you're looking for your wife. You, your longer hand is up there, talking to God constantly and say, Lord, I find a sister. I say, ah, no, you can't, you can't marry her. This is the reason. This is the reason. I say, thank you, Lord. You know, but if the shorter hand is up there, in fact, you are already ahead. I say, hey, look, I, I forgot to tell you, I found a sister and we are getting married in a few days. It's because your shorter hand is up. You are a child of God. There's no doubt about that. But you don't check the details of God. So I think what is important is checking the details with God. Because God sees beyond what we can see. There are issues that even after 15 years in marriage, we begin to manage them. You know, we begin to manage them. What is the problem between us and our cousins? The problem between us and our cousins is that they are better than their God. If tomorrow their God said them, that your friend is a kafir, do this to him, as nice as they are, you are gone. So that's the difference between us and them. Now for us, our longer hand is with God when we are searching for something on earth. You know, so I think that's the approach I think people should use. Pastor Ademo, I must tell you that is a fantastic, that is a fantastic analogy. Wow, I've never, I've never ever heard that before. And uh, I believe that everyone listening right now knows very well uh, not to put both hands up, you know, mm. or to put both hands down. You have to put your longer hand up. So that you connect to God who is higher than high, and then your shorter hand, then you just try to, you know, navigate and everything. I, I think I think that's 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 beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Demo. Um now, Mervin, I'm going to um come back to you. Uh, Mervin, there's a there's a uh, there's I'll say there's a fear, there's a misconception that if you do if you do not have the connections, if you do not know uh, people who are influential, you cannot get into uh, into the energy sector. You know, I think uh, maybe that is off of the back of the idea that most of these uh, uh, most of the energy uh, institutions, energy firms, are you know big, high up there. You have the the big wigs, you know, securing slots as is believed with them. So a lot of people have that I, I have that mindset that if you were not, you know, if you don't know someone in French, York, you're not connected, getting into the energy sector is easier, uh, is, uh, is harder than a camel getting through a needle's eye. What is your take on that? Mm. I mean, just like you said, it's a misconception, right? Um, it's not true. Um, it may be happening in a few places or in a few pockets, but generally that's not true. Um, I didn't get into the energy industry because I knew somebody. Um, it was great to have people that I could look up to certainly um, that were already working in the energy sector and I could ask questions. Um, but it wasn't because any of them was in any of those companies that I got in. I applied um, like everybody else would be expected to. And I did the test. I did the interviews and I got the job. There's an element of grace at work in my own life, clearly, but 
you know, it's important that you know that there are processes and there are systems and there are structures in these places that guide recruitment and hiring on all of those things that you may be thinking about. I'm so sorry. So they just took power. It's Africa. Clear. <laughs> but back to the question. Um, so one thing I always tell mentees and as many people who um, I speak to about the energy industry is that you need to Uh, okay, um, I think uh, the fact that uh, Mervyn lost power there has uh, caused us to uh, cost our connection to be suspended. So we're just going to uh, we're going to take uh, can you hear me, everyone? Okay, so we're going to take a question to uh, Pastor Adeyemo. We're going to take a question to Pastor Adeyemo. Uh, Pastor Adeyemo, I uh, there's a there's a there's a there's a subject I mean which you you mentioned there's a subject that you mentioned you you talked about uh, uh, much you talked about eating you from the same port feeding from the same port and we have a question here uh, someone is saying that denomination is seeming to be a problem. You know, when it comes to marital issues, where you have, uh, uh, you know, you're, I'm from this church, I'm from that church, you know. And you, you seem to have mentioned it, but I would, I would like you to let us know, what is your take on, what is your counsel, so to speak, on uh, denominational variations between Christians when it comes to the subject of marriage? Uh, thank you very much. Um... I believe that, you know, first we discuss him because we are family members. Now, uh, if you look at how far Abraham went to make sure that we got this right for Isaac, it shows us how important it is to try as much as possible to stay at home. Now, what is home for you as a member of the Dean Christian of God? You know, every year you have the opportunity to know the leanings of your father. That's our father and the Lord, Pastor and our leaders of the mission. You know their leaning. You know, for example, that in March, we have special legal service. In August, we have convention, as we will be having. And in December, we have the Congress. Who are those people that daddy has no issues with? Who are those issues that daddy feels comfortable to say, take the pulpit? I think such people also can take care of daddy's daughters. They can take care of daddy's son. So, uh, much as I'm not saying everybody needs to marry in the redeemed Christian church of God, God is not leading you to marry anyone here, why not? But ask yourself, where are those places that your father trusts? You know, so it's not sufficient for you to hear certain names of places where people worship, sounding as if uh, somebody is shooting guns, and that's the place where you're going to pick a wife. You need to ask yourself, why as the head man of this organization, why has he never been invited to our altar? Why? You know, so if you ask those questions, you will probably be able to know that much as you can marry uh, any child of God, you need to be concerned about what their fathers have been feeding them. You know, that they emphasize even the little things that they emphasize them, you know. Um, so you need to look at it and say, God didn't lead you to the redeemed Christian church of God for nothing. He has led you to the redeemed Christian church of God for a purpose. So you should ask yourself, who are the friends of our mission? Who are the friends of our church? I think don't go beyond that. In the Arab world and, and in the Jewish world, uh, the first option is the cousin. And if the cousin is not available, then it becomes the cousin of cousins. So they try as much as possible to retain the royal seed, not to make sure they go too far. Because at the moment you begin to go too far, you begin to see new things that surprises you, you know. 
And don't forget, there's going to be storm at some point. When they had some, they called Jesus. If Jesus had something else he practices, that is what he will have done. But he doesn't have another thing he practices. You know, so if you have chosen a spouse in a place where they have no problem to light candles, to pray over problems, you get ready to light candles because that's what you've done. You know, so you don't, uh, uh, I don't have problem with denominational uh, breaking the borders and barriers, but be guided. And our Father and the Lord has helped us without talking by inviting again and again certain categories of people to minister in our church. At the convention, there are people you didn't even see on the, on the altar up there, but they take seminars and stuff like that. So you should be a member of this church through and through. You should be able to know who are the friends of our mission. I think if you know them, you have no problem choosing spouses there if God is leading you there. Well, wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, again, um, you have, uh, you know, shown forth uh, the wisdom of God upon your life uh, with the dynamic yet very simple way you have approached uh, the questions that have been thrown at you. Um, uh, while we're still waiting for Mervyn, I'm trusting that Mervyn uh, will be able to get back in on here. Uh, please, everyone, uh, let's understand the way we have the power loss uh, on the end of our energy uh, speaker. So I'm sure that's why people like I in the industry where we're going to be able at some point in the future to enjoy uninterrupted energy for real. Um, while we wait for her to uh, get... I'm you know, here. While we, so oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I apologize. No, no, that's, yeah. that's absolutely Again, okay. This is, this is the okay. challenge. And we... We need talents to come fix this problem. We need to put an end to it completely. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Mervyn, you're welcome. You're welcome back. You're welcome back. Thank you. Uh, so I just, I, I just want to finish my um, line of uh, thoughts with uh, Pastor Adiemo before we get back to you. Uh, so Pastor Adiemo, okay. um, thank you again for what you said so far. But what I want to put to you today is what is the role of parents? You know, probably I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a young person and I have my hand up. My longer hand is already up. My shorter hand is already down. You understand? And um, I know that, yes, I want to marry this uh, beautiful lady. But then my parents are, are, you know, of a different opinion. My parents say they have a choice. They have a say and who I marry, or else I won't get their blessings. What, 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 what do you think of that, Pastor Ian? Pastor Ian, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you, you hear, hear my question, sir? Yes, yes quite, well. quite well. Now, uh, right. one, of the, one of the requirements or qualifications for someone to go get married is that you should be mature, you know? Uh, your parents know who you are mature. Your parents respect opinion, your opinion quite a lot. So 80% of the time, what you've said won't, won't happen to mature people because they know, you know, how this individual has taken a lot of decisions, even contributing to decisions of the family, at family meetings, and um, it's been so effective. But there are occasions when the parent says no. Now, when parents say no, and you are convinced that this is what the law wants you to do, uh, what, what you still need to do is to be, uh, to insist. Insistence, uh, not by shouting or by screaming. There are people that your parents respect, you know, who also respect you. You need to start talking to them, you know. Um, the only problem is when your parents are not born again. And that's not even a complex problem, too. If you have shown yourself, as uh, responsible in so many ways in the past. I'll give you an example. When we were getting married, you know, when I was going to meet them for the first time, I had a concern. So we wrapped the wine from air to toe, beautifully wrapped. You know, people would do that kind of case when two years ago were not many, but we got somebody. So wrapped it so beautifully that they, you must be wicked to tear it in our presence. So we wrapped those, uh, you know, non alcoholic drinks and we presented them. And so while we were there, my father-in-law began to say so much about my wife, you know, that uh, when they were writing the list, 
that day was not it was day to collect the list. When they were writing the list and they put cartons of beer and cartons of stout, he said, ah, for Nike, that's impossible. I have not seen the man is bringing. But you will never bring somebody who will be able to buy those things. Because my wife has an age mate on the same roof. And so when the dad says, serve me my drink, which was the native palm wine, say, ah, Nick, I know I'm not talking to you because you are a hallelujah church person. You know. And the other one we serve and take some. And he said in that place that if it is this one that's bringing somebody, oh, you will write anything for the fellow. So what I'm trying to say is that don't let it be the time you want to get married that your people know you as a Christian. Otherwise, you will face this kind of issues. Your parents must know you are a Christian before you get to the point of getting married. For example, they've told you that this is happening to uncle. Say, ah, daddy, we will need to fast and pray about it. And I'll put it as prayer. I will tell our pastor. They begin to put you in your own class. So don't wait until the time you want to get married to start having this kind of stress. From the beginning, let them know who you are. Excuse yourself sometime from the family Christmas meeting because there's go out fishing. Let them know who you are. When you begin to define who you are, it's easier for them to respect you and your opinion. But if they say no, look for who love, who they respect. Look for who can talk to them because you know where God is leading you and the Lord will help you out in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Yeah, thank you very much, Pastor Diemo, for that uh, wonderful uh, analogy yet again. Uh, I would just like to put a footnote to it. So what Pastor Diemo is trying to also tell us, uh, in short, is your values. Whatever, it is not until you want to get married before your parents have to know where you stand. All right? Because if they have known your values all along, they will respect your choices at the end of the day. Yeah, true story, true story. Um, thank you very much, Pastor Diemo. Uh, now, uh, back to Mervyn. Uh, Mervyn, are you there? Mervyn? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, all right. So, <clears throat> Mervyn, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm really grateful for something that you said. I didn't even know that was, uh, you know, that was uh, obtainable in the energy sector. Uh, which is what you said, that it is necessary for you mm -hmm. to practice engaging your mind before engaging your hands, right? That is, that is really, really beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to ask you two questions in one, because we're really short of, on time. Uh, we have uh, less than uh, seven minutes to wrap this up. What is the role of technology and IT for those with that background? You know, what is it? What is it? What is the role and the future, you know, in, in the energy sector for technology and IT, for those with that background? And then uh, also, Mervyn, you mentioned lab techs, <clears throat> sales and marketing, policy and government relations, legal, sustainability. Is there anything for people in communications? Oh, absolutely. I, I forgot to mention that. So, uh, so please, certainly, wrap, wrap, you have, wrap, 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 you have opportunities for them. <laughs> okay, no, no, just, just, okay. just, just answer so, the question. Uh, yeah. yeah, so basically, um, we can't do without technology. And for as long as I know, Slumberger has been a technology company. So we've been using technologies across, you know, decades to deliver energy. The, te the, the equipment we're installing in the world today are, uh, designed as technologies. We use IT. We've had a bunch of digital systems, you know, running for as long as possible. But then with the industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, there is so many, like so many opportunities for technologies or people with ICT um, backgrounds to come in and deliver value. We need, you know, our technology to be smarter, we need those technologies to deliver much more than safety, um, efficiencies in how we operate, you know, productivity for us, reliability. We want, again, like, like you had seen just now with, with me getting on this call, I need a technology to make sure that I can stay on reliably as possible. You need uh, technologies to deliver on sustainability as well, because we want to do things uh, faster, smarter, and even better. And technology will certainly play a huge role in that. 
That's simply, and we can extend the conversation, but for, for the sake of time, I'll just keep you at that. And then in terms of communications, we see what's happening around the world in terms of racial justice and all of those things. So beyond the internal communications that we do and the need to also define and, you know, make sure that our brand and reputation is, you know, right. Uh, and communications experts will help us do all of that. There's a need to have engagement in some of the issues that are happening around the world and the people who lead those conversations beyond even the CEOs and other high level executives or, you know, leaders in the industry, they're communication experts, you know, thinking through how those the words and information or messages come through and come out to the public, right? So we need people to manage all of that um, within the energy industry. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mervyn. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, the, the communication bit was a personal question. I'm sure you can figure that out. And uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I see. <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask uh, a final question from Pastor Adeyemo. And then I'll let our panelists just uh, give us a closing, uh, maybe one liner uh, for this uh, segment. Uh, now, uh, Pastor Diemo, uh, someone has a question uh, and the person says, you, you find uh, um, a spouse who is, whose parents are not Christians and they are insisting that um, your union must be uh, confirmed and, uh, you know, officialized in a mosque, so to speak. Uh, how, do you, how, how do you handle that? How do you handle that? Uh, I mean, let's be practical. This fellow knows that this is who God wants to marry. The parents of that fellow are unbelievers. I mean, not born again. Uh, they may be nominal church goers. And they are saying you have to uh, formalize this marriage <coughs> within a month. Is that not? A mosque. A mosque. Oh, a mosque. <laughs> we had that before, actually. Where you and one of us was going to get married. The sister comes to church and everything, and the parents are saying, we will do what they, that, it has a name, but I don't know, the, the, Nikai. Nikai, that yeah, have, Nikai. They have to do Nikai. <clears throat> um, I don't know whether that is practical now, because the truth is that in the 365 days in a year, when we were youth, we probably, when I mean when we were youth, when we were not married, we were still youth. When we were not married, we practically fasted half of those, half of the year. So what we said is no problem. Even those who couldn't afford transport fare, we will make it available. And everybody is eating it by them. And we are flooding that month. We were there on, uh, Nikai was Friday or Saturday morning. Okay. We were there on Thursday night to pray around the mosque. We were there in front of the mosque on Friday, and on Saturday we were all there. So as soon as they say this, we say, hey, man, this of the... Well, that was then. The truth, the truth is that now, they're leading prayer, and you're having your coffee with you, and say, Father, we thank you. You're joining online, you're on your bed. So I don't know the... I, <laughs> I would say, somebody comes to me, and I say, well, we need to wait and see how much you can convince the... The, the, the father, uh, but it's not what we've not seen before. But if you spiritually prepared for, for such a thing, if you are, I will stop you. I'll say, go ahead, because you also take a child that is driven by a Muslim. You do everything. We are mm -hmm. talking to you now, it's used by a Muslim. So, and I'm paying the rent and stuff like that. So if you convince them they're not going to be convinced, then you go to uh, option B. Option B is flood the place with your brethren, declare this of fasting, take the place for the Lord, Take absolute control of the place. That's it. We have a church in a place they call Lucia. So we got to the place. The only place they gave us was their community shrine. They usually have a big hall. They divide it into two. The small half, the small part of the division will be for the head of goat, head of cow, everything they've used to sacrifice to idols before. So they said they can't give us that one. We said, why not? We just need to put some clothes, no children can use it. They said, no, no, no. So the big hall, we took it. And people were saying, why would you take it? Because that's the gate of the village. We take it. So uh, if you prepare for such, it's not really a big, as big as we think. Because it's, it's a value. As we speak to you now, 80% of the church that we have in the UAE rent places to use. And when we leave, some other people also rent it. So 
whatever they want to do, it depends on how spiritually prepared for that. In fact, you will have words before that day. And then we'll take over that shrine or, or mosque or whatever. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Adeyemo. Uh, I mean, I really love what you have said there, that um, it doesn't matter if God has told you that's the person you want to marry. Then it's an evangelistic opportunity for you to stomp wherever it is uh, they want you to come to. Um, I mean, except you are operating in disobedience, that is when it is going to be a trap. Yes, and, uh, thank you very, very much. A beautiful example you have also given us. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you to please just finish, I mean, wrap up your bit with uh, maybe just uh, one uh, charge so that I can go to Mervyn and ask Mervyn a question. And as she's answering, she would also wrap up uh, the segment because we are already out of time. Okay, so uh, thank you again for having me. And uh, uh, the word I want to drop with us is that God that helps you through every other phase of life is more than ready to help you through marriage. In fact, it's interested in your marriage as much as it's interested in other parts of your life. And please, don't see marriage as something very complex because of what you see in the social media. Majority of the people that you read about are entertainers. And... Um, mm -hmm. For them, it was like any other business, you know, business contracts, you know, and stuff like that. But for you as a child of God, God is interested in your life. So don't be afraid and say, will my marriage work? It will work because as long as you remain with God, when you eat and you are satisfied, don't forget the God that brought you out of Egypt. As long as you remain with God, <laughs> your marriage continues to remain a beautiful marriage. So the Lord will help us in Jesus' mind. Somebody said, can I marry in any church if somebody does? I, I would say don't go to any synagogue of Satan to pick a wife. If a wife is comfortable in the synagogue of Satan, something's already wrong with her. That's what I will tell you. The other person said that uh, God can give wife to those he loves. Give me one, I, 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 you know, but I ask him. So he will tap you in your bed and say, brother, this is your wife. Or this is your husband. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. So thank you. I hope. Uh, 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 yeah, you thank have, you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Pastor Diemo. Uh, Mervyn, what is the future of energy? Is it solar? Is it water? Is it spiritual? Is it, uh, you know, what is the future of energy? <laughs> even, as, even as you wrap this up, even as you wrap this up, what's the future of energy? Okay. So um, the future of energy is bright, certainly. It's uh, low carbon and it's uh, resilient and sustainable. It won't be knocked by a lot of this uh, weather uncertainties or, you know, oil price, uh, cyclicity or volatility. It would be as resilient and sustainable as possible. Um, there's certainly a huge opportunity to invest in solar wind. And I usually would say that there is no single um, or silver bullet for um, the future of energy. It's not going to be totally dependent on solar because solar can, as much as we know that solar has the resource that can power the entire earth, there are certainly many other places where we can't naturally get um, solar to power their systems just now. Um, massive industries like, you know, or heavy duty industries like cementing, especially those ones in the construction side of things, or long haul transport like airplanes and stuff. In the short term, there's not a chance that we can power all of that with solar energy, unless of course we develop the technologies that can drive that. But I'd say that it's a, it's a uh, multi-dimensional piece. You're going to have to use all the resources that we have as long as we are minimizing um, the impact on the environment. We want to preserve the earth. We want to preserve the planet. We don't want to destroy it. Um, I'm sure some of you already feel the heat these days, or we see how much the rain disrupts things. Sometimes you don't even know which, which day is raining, which month or season is rainy season or dry season. The rain comes at different times because the climate patterns have been disrupted. So we don't want to keep that going. Um, there's already so much risk in the system and the system is already trying to manage and adapt to that, but we don't want to create more problems for the system. So right. we're going to have to leverage as many resources as possible, but limiting uh, carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions on the planet, right? Um, and just to wrap up, 
I remember that was cut off during the, the last question, but I'll just say very quickly that there are limitless opportunities for everyone in the energy sector. Um, but then the only opportunity, um, the only way you can, you know, take advantage of those is by making sure that you're a person of value, that you have a balanced skill set, not just technical skills, but you have those high cognitive skills, um, you know, other people's skills in terms of like how to communicate, how to engage stakeholders and manage them, crisis management and all of those things. So you need a broad spectrum of skills to be able to work. You need to come with the right mindset otherwise it will be difficult for you to deliver the value that you perhaps think that you have or the value that the company uh, or industry expects you to deliver and so i would just say simply dare to discover there's so much and dare to pursue thank you all right thank you very much mervin e azeta and that's mervin energy Azeta. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dare to dream, dare to pursue, dare to achieve, right? Thank you so, yeah. so, so much. And thank you, Pastor Tokumbo Adeyemo. You have been, whoosh. I mean, both of you, this, this final session has been amazing on career and relationship. Don't forget, it is still the RCCG Africa 3 Continental Youth Convention. And right after now, we are going to be transitioning into a session of worship that will be coming to us through uh, the YouTube and the Facebook platform. So if you are watching right now, this is not the end of it. This is just the beginning. And like I said earlier, we cannot go lower than we have already uh, started with. So please, the link has been shared. I'm sure the link is in the comment section. So you look at that, copy it, and post, uh, post it in your browser and make sure you remain a part of this uh, convention. It promises to be a blessing indeed, all right? All of the program continues on YouTube and Facebook immediately after now. So please endeavor to be a part of it. And by the end of today, please note that we return tomorrow for the day two of the convention at exactly the same time. So ladies and gentlemen, viewers worldwide, remember that Everything that will be shared requires us that first off, you write down a vision. I'm sure some of us are catching visions now. Make sure you write it down, you pray with it, and I know that all will go well. I look forward to uh, seeing us all again tomorrow. But for now, we'll continue with the rest of the program, even as we go into a session of worship. God bless you. Stay with us. Praise the Lord. To as many that are hearing me right now, shout hallelujah. You are welcome to this glorious Continental Youth Convention. I want to welcome everybody. May the Almighty God bless us tremendously as we continue with this convention in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to lift up our soul right now, wherever we may be, in our home, in our office, in our bedroom, anywhere. I want you to lift up your voice and begin to appreciate God. Say, Father, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Bless me to your only name. Lift up your voice and adore him. Magnify him because he's the king of glory. Worship him, give him all the praise, give him all the honor, give him all the adoration, give him all the glory. Say, Father, thank you, Father, thank you, Father, thank you, Father, thank you. Bless be to your only name. Rebo Gosada Rabaka Shedri Rebogoseta Rabagada de Rebo Gosoto Lima Rebragada Rebo Gosetele Malibra Gede Risha Travaskata Father will Rabo Gosetele Marebo Gosoto Father will bless you Father will worship you Father will honor you Take all the glory in the mighty name of Jesus in Jesus the mighty name we have given thanks I want us to lift up our voice and worship God with this song I want us to tell him that is worthy you are worthy Jesus, you are worthy, you are worthy to be glorified. You are worthy, Jesus, you are worthy, you are worthy to be glorified. Hallelujah, you are worthy, Jesus, you are worthy, you are worthy to be glorified. You are worthy, Jesus, you are worthy. You are worthy to be glorified. 
I want us to bless him now and say, Father, thank you. Bless Zebi to your only name. Let's appreciate God for this Africa theory. Let's say, Father, we bless you. Let's celebrate the Almighty God for this region. Let's say, Father, we magnify you. Let's exalt him. Let's thank God on behalf of all our pastors. Let's thank God on behalf of all our leaders. Let's say, Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for how you have been using them for us in this region. Thank you for how you have been using them for us in this continent. Father, take all the glory. Father, take all the glory. Father, take all the glory. Father, take all the honor. In Jesus, the mighty name, we have given thanks. Also, I want us to also appreciate God now for this great wonder, for this great thing that is happening right now. This is the first of its kind, Continental Youth Convention. Let's appreciate God because you and I is a living witness. Let's say, Father, I bless you because you make me a living witness of this great move in this city. Thank you for this convention, the first of its kind in this Africa theory, Continental Convention, Continental Youth Convention. Take all the glory in Jesus, the mighty name we have prayed in the word of God. When we share the book of Habakkuk, when we share the book of Habakkuk, when we look at it, the word of the Lord makes us to understand. He said we should write down the vision. He said the vision may be tarried, but yet it will come to pass. We are going to talk to the Almighty God. We are going to say, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, even as we go on in this read your convention. Father, the purpose, your vision for this region, your vision for you, your vision for this Africa theory. Father, please let it come to pass as a reason of this convention. Father, begin to fulfill it in the name of Jesus. Father, begin to fulfill it in the name of Jesus. Let it come to reality. In Jesus' name, we pray. The word of the Lord make us to understand. When you go for that, he said the soul that has been lifted up, he said the soul is not pure, but the just shall live by faith. Let's talk to God. Whatever that will not let us to receive, every impure thought, every evil imagination, every sin in our life that may hinder us, let's say, Father, forgive now in the name of Jesus. Every sin in our life that has been dimming our vision, Father, have mercy now in the name of Jesus. Let's say, Father, beginning from today, as we are starting this conversion, give us a clear revelation, grace to fulfill your mandate. In this region, bless the be to your name. Glory be to your name. In Jesus, the mighty name, we have prayed. Heavenly Father, we bless you. Take all the glory. Take all the honor. All that you are going to use now. Fresh anointing to function. Thank you, Abba Father. In Jesus, the mighty name, we have prayed. Celebrate the King of glory. Celebrate the Lord of Lord. God bless you. Stop our hands and just begin to bless the name of the Lord God Almighty. He's a faithful God. Just worship Him for who He is. Adore Him. From the ages past, He remains the same. Just worship Him. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Father, we worship Him.
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We give glory to God Almighty and with the utmost joy of the Lord, I'd like to welcome you to the maiden edition of the Redeemed Christian Church of God Continental Youth Convention of the African Three Continent. African Three Continent consists of the Redeemed Christian Church of God parishes in the southwest Nigeria and in the Middle East region. We want to give thanks and glory to God and to appreciate our daddies and mommies in the Lord who have given us this platform. We want to thank our daddy and mommy, Daddy Gio, Mommy Gio. Thank you very much, sir, for this opportunity. Our continental overseer, Daddy and Mommy Odeshola, we thank you. God bless you, sir. Our assistant continental overseer and the wife, Pastor Boniface Okenwa. We want to also appreciate our indefatigable youth pastor, IYP, Pastor Belemina Obunge and the wife. And all the country coordinators of the Redeemed Christian Church of God and the youth leaders in the southwest Nigeria. We want to thank you for releasing your youth to work with us. And these youth leaders have tirelessly worked with us for the past one month in putting this program together. It is our prayer that God of heaven will bless us abundantly from this convention in the name of Jesus. The theme for this convention is Write Down the Vision from the book of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 2. This particular scripture is actually talking to the youth because in the book of Joel chapter 2, verse 24, the Bible says, The young men shall see vision, while the old one shall dream dreams. It is our prayer that the God-given vision shall be delivered to us in clear terms, even as the speakers begin to speak to us one after the other in this convention. And I trust God that at the end of this glorious convention, the life of our young ones, male and female, will never remain the same again in the name of Jesus. I beseech you, therefore, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you will write down the visions, write down the messages as it shall be delivered unto you. Hallelujah. By the grace of God Almighty, myself and my wife, and the entire committee, like to welcome you all to this maiden convention. God bless you. Have a wonderful and a glorious time in God's presence. Amen. Thank you. I need my money. What money again? Ah, my money now. What I was giving you? What are you saying? You're trying to save this money for six months. This is just a friend. This is not of your business. I need my money. Give me my money now. Give me my money. What's going on by you? See, I'll choose a bad girl. I'll choose a bad girl. Okay, wake up. Yeah. We're already in 2010. Rodan, wake up, wake up, it's New Year already, wake up. Happy New Year! Wake up, wake up, Rodan, Happy uh, New Year! Father, we're in 2010 already. So, Happy New Year, my brother. Happy New Year, my brother. So, Rodan, what's your plan for this year, Rodan? My brother, I will go now, I will go for that, my professional certificate exam. That will make me a supervisor. Rodan. The same professional course you talked about last year and year before, what? Is that not what you said last year? Same thing you said last year, Brodan. No, this time I'm serious. This time I'm serious, I will go. Okay, okay fine. Let me ask you, Brodan. Have you written your plans to succeed this year or is only not saying? Because that was the last Brother, thing you keep saying each worry, year. I will go. Brodan, you know, I know why I'm saying this to you. Have you written them down or still the same way of, you know, saying, saying just words? Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm serious. This time I'm serious. Mm. Brodan. I'm serious. This is I'm your life, you know. This time. Okay, well, if you say so.
Well done. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, my brother. You know, it's 2012, you know, without any professional certificate. My brother, so she's life. Brother, what is your plan this year? You see, I know I was not focused last year. And considering that I had to do this burial ceremony for my little one. Bro, Dan, you have been, you know, you are good in giving excuses. Bro, Dan. No, no, see. How is this year not different from last year? Yeah, you see, this year, this year, I must, I must take this professional uh, safety kit exam. That will make me the supervisor. I promise you, you see. But do you have any plan to achieve that, bro? Dan, have you written your plans down? How do you plan to achieve it? See, uh, I need you to do me a favor. What, what favor? Okay. Uh, every month I'll be giving you like 500 so you can help me save. You know my kind of person, I can't save. I need to be saving like 500 with you. Okay, so how much is this professional exam? It's around 3,000 dirhams. If you're saving 500 dirhams every month, that means 500 dirhams. Uh, that means by June you should be you should enroll for the exam. Yeah, of course. Are you sure of this, bro, Dan? Yes, yes, I'm. I'm so sure of it. Dan, if you're if you're sure about it, well, I can help you. Sure. That means if you start um, saving the 500 by by June, you should be writing the exam. Yeah, yeah. What's up now? Mm. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, my brother. This is 2014, you know? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't bother to ask you what your plan this year because <laughs> it has been the same old story, you know? Uh, you, you that is asking me my plan, my plan. What is your own plan, Seth? Uh, well, my plan this year basically is to get married. And I've been saving. I've been praying for that, so basically my plan this year is just to settle down, get married. That's just wow. You are not serious. Well, you, you are joking with me, right? I am one hundred percent serious, bro. Dan, one hundred percent serious. So let me ask you, bro. Dan, what is your plan? Oh, you see that my professional certificate is on. See, I, I found that I found a shortcut where I can get the certificate without a win for the exam. Rodan, how how is that possible? Have you completely lost your way? Come on. No, see, I met I met this guy last week, okay, and the guy is doing it. He has done it for so many people. It takes only one thousand five hundred. Whoa, 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 Rodan, Rodan, this 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 is a sin. You know that you 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 must have lost it. This is a sin. It's not. Should, this is a sin. But it is not. It's not. <coughs> See, the guy even mentioned that he has done it for a lot of our brethren in the church. Really? Yeah. Brother, hundred percent legit. I, 
Brodan, if if you've paid, I am not encouraging you to do that because it's a sin. You know that. But all I would say to you, Brodan, is just you know you just have to be careful because these guys out there, they are all fraudsters. They are all fraudsters. Don't worry, bro. I'll be Brodan, careful. they are all fraudsters. You have to be careful. Yeah, I will. Catch you later. No problem. Take care of yourself, bro. Thanks. What is happening to this number? This this guy number is not going. Ha! Ha! What? What is happening? This guy number is not connecting. It's switched off. Ah! Since I sent him money since last two weeks. You 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 mean the guy you paid one five for the professional exam? Yes, yeah, so the guy. His number is not connecting. This is very strange. <laughs> Brother, they don't catch you, Mugu. You know, I, in fact, I was telling you about these guys, how they operate. I told you this guy is a fraudulent. I told you he's a froster. I warned you about these guys, how they operate. They don't catch you. Ha! Ah. God, my money. No, they don't catch you, Mugu. You should be, you are satisfied now, Nabi. <laughs> wow. Oh, well, um... Bro, bro, Dan, I'm sorry about that, but you know, I am moving out tomorrow. I'll be leaving tomorrow. I've got a, a bigger apartment somewhere and I'm done. So, oh, Dave, you're leaving me? Of course, bro, Dan, I told you my wedding is in four weeks' time. And I can't leave here with myself and my wife, of course, you know that. So, I'm moving out with my own to my own place, you know. You're leaving me like this, bro Dave. We just have to leave. We have to move, you know. So you are leaving me now. Now that I needed you the most. Brodan. Honestly, I have to end. See, see, Brodan. I hope you take your life more serious. God will not wait for you forever. There are no shortcuts in life. You have to, you, you have to like commit yourself to God. You have to be diligent. You have to be prayerful. You have to be serious with your life. You know, write your vision down. Come on, you can break it in small goals. Work diligently. You know, I never cease to ask God for grace. I'm sorry for your loss, but you just have to take your life serious. Let somebody shout hallelujah. I welcome every one of you to the African Three Continent uh, Youth Convention for the year 2021. This is the first of its kind, and I want you to know that God is set to do a new thing in your life. The theme of this convention reads, write down the vision. And the anchor test for this convention is Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for today. We give you all the glory. We appreciate you because there's none like you. And we say, be thou exalted in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for this session. We pray, O oh Lord, that you come and have your way. Do what you alone can do and glorify your name in Jesus' name. Father, I commit myself to your hand. I pray, O oh Lord, that none of me but all of you, that you, will, that you will be glorified and everyone will be blessed in Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for you alone is worthy in Jesus' name. I want to thank the Lord for my father in the Lord, the general overseer of this mission, the continental overseer and the IYP who has given me this privilege to stand before you all today. I pray that the almighty God will take all the glory in Jesus' name. I'll be, take, I'll be talking to you on dynamics of vision, the dynamics of vision. And my Bible test is Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. And I'll be reading from the Amplified Version. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, 
we created in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned before end, for all taking part which he, he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. May the Lord bless his word in our ears in Jesus' name. When we're talking about the dynamics of vision, we talk about the process, the procedures, and the how vision is being actualized. Uh, what is vision? Vision is seen true to a future time. In other words, vision is envisioning how to get to a future time. Vision is the direction to your destination. Vision is the direction to your destination. And also, true vision is not all about seeing the future, but seeing true, seeing true to a future time. Seeing true connotes formulating and reckoning with the right procedure, the right process, and the principles of arriving at the future, at the future that you have pictured. True vision is chiefly about how you intend to arrive at a future time. May the Lord bless us in Jesus' name. Vision is light. Vision is sight. Vision is like a route to a place. Vision is not the address to, to a place, but the direction to the place. The place is the future. From a standard point, which is your present, vision is like a map. Vision is a navigator. Henceforth, you need to see vision as a direction and not a destination. Any vision, please note, any vision without action plan, that is, any vision without the how, is a mere dream. I may not see the light of the day, or the vision may die prematurely. Vision is not dream. Vision is not dream. We need to um, understand that clearly. Vision can, can come um, through thoughts, or ideas, or inspiration, or strong desire to find a solution to a problem. However, every vision is centered on your purpose, either consciously or subconsciously. Vision is centered on your purpose. Let, let's note this. You cannot feature in the future you did not picture. You cannot feature in the future you did not feature. Let's look at some of the strategies of vision. Number one, you need to see it. Vision must be seen. You have to catch the glimpse of the future. Vision will facilitate and attract, and attract when you can see it. Vision will motivate your action. Vision excites you. And vision is the foundation for endurance. Number two things, number two uh, strategy, you need to share your vision. Vision not shared is like a dead vision. You need to extend the vision by sharing it. You need to share the vision to spread it. And number three, you need to seek for assistance. Visionaries, normally they invite input of others in the pursuit of vision. We'll be looking at this as we proceed in the name of Jesus. It is crucial to have a clear vision for the mandate you have received in life. It is, clear, it is crucial to have a clear vision for the mandate you have received and for the ministry into which you have called. It is important to understand the how to accomplish. For every vision, there is a specific, um, a specific and a specified way for its fulfillment. For every vision from God, there is a commensurate provision which God himself has made available for you. Vision can come from man. Vision can come from God. Every vision from man will die. Every vision from God will stay forever. I want you to know that uh, the means by which you accomplish your vision, that is the source of transport, the conveyance that made it possible, it's, it, it's, 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 it's what is called vision. You need to know how to get to that vision, to that end that you have seen. From the, from the point of visualization to up to the point of actualization, the process is what vision talks about. Doing the right thing in a wrong way turns to a wrong thing. So you need to know the means and the peculiar uh, uh, means of, of getting the vision that God has given to you to be done. Now, how do we get this vision to be done? 
How do you see the vision? What are the things you need to put in place to get the vision acquired? We are going to look at a few things. Number one, we have to look at what to do. What to do. We have said earlier, I've said earlier that vision without action, we die. So, vision, what are the kind of activities you need to do? A vision remain abstract until you do something about it. God who gave you the vision is committed and is faithful to show you what to do. To show you what to do about the vision he has laid in your, in your head. Sometimes the vision and, and the things God asks you to do may not actually make sense to you. But if you follow God and do exactly what he asks you to do, you will get to your destination. What to do about your vision have nothing to do about the, the, the environment you are, about calling people. It's just about you following the principles of God. But one thing I want you to know is that there is something to do, either little or small, when that you are on the move. For example, when God gave Joshua a vision about crossing the Jordan, God told him, Jordan is overflowed. Joshua followed the procedures of God by allowing the Levite to go in with the Ark of the Covenant and, and Jordan parted. But you know, one thing you need to know clearly is that when we talk about what to do, you are not to follow the procedures of others. You don't say because somebody did it this way. God does not, may not repeat his ways because he has multiple of options. In, uh, in the case of Moses, he told Moses, lift up your hands and read he parted. When it came to the time of Joshua, he told Joshua ask people to walk in and then the, the river parted. So you need to, to pursue your vision based on God's direction to know what to do at every time. Number two thing, where to be where your location is of a great importance to, to your fulfilling your vision. Your, your, your location is very important. It is important to discover your vision and, and also to discover the location. If you miss your location, you will miss your allocation. If you are at the wrong place, you might miss what God wants you to do for your life. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 11 made it clear to us that it is not by power, not because you are fast, not because you are strong, but it says chance and time happen to them all. So there are some things that will not happen in your life unless you are at the right place. Unless you are at the right place. And for you to be at the right place, you need God to order your steps. And that's why the Bible says in Psalm 37 verse 23, Psalm 37 verse 23, the Bible says, the steps of a, right, of a good man are ordered by the Lord. You need your steps to be ordered by the Lord. You need your steps to be ordered by the Lord. You must allow your steps to be ordered by the Lord. And that is very important. The, the intelligent people don't always make it. But you need to be at the right place at the right time. Because your allocation depends on your location. Number three thing. What? Path to take, what pathway to take. The pathway is also prepared by God. The Bible says in Psalm 37, verse 5, it says, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. In verse, uh, Proverbs 3 6, God says, All thy ways, in all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. When you acknowledge God, when you put him first, he will, he will definitely direct your path. There is a pathway for you to fulfill what God has laid on your heart. That is for you to fulfill your vision. There is a pathway. And once you miss that pathway, many things will go wrong. The Bible gave us an example of people who walk with God, who listen to God, and they fulfill their vision. Jesus Christ, when you read, that, when you read John chapter 7, it is it, a man that was seriously focusing on where God wants him to be. Even his brother was telling him, it is time for you to move, to go and show yourself. He said, my time has not come. But for you, your time has, has come. So stop making plans by yourself, but allow the Holy Spirit to put you at the right place at the right time. Learn to keep steps with the Holy Spirit, and the Lord will bless you 
as you do that in Jesus' name. Number four thing, who to walk with. You need to be careful who to walk with, who to travel with. You can, ask, you can see the story, of jo- uh, 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 the story of Jonah. When God sent him to Nineveh, he boarded, a, he, 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 he boarded the ship. Everyone on that ship, they lost everything that belonged to them. Who you journey with in the journey of life determines either your vision will come to pass or not. Don't, do not travel with those that will slow you down. You don't have to slow uh, journey with those that will slow you down. Some of us want to mingle and hang around people who does not believe in your vision, who does not have the same zeal that God gave you. You cannot fulfill your vision that way. You need to, you, you need to choose who you travel with. Don't walk with those who are not ready to improve on their speed. They, they, they can't understand your reason and your, see, and, and your zeal for God. The Bible says don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. It, it doesn't mean about marriage alone. In every facet of life, in business, in relationship, in, ma- in church, in fellowship, don't mingle. Don't be unequally yoked. It is, a, it is wrong for you to be unequally yoked. It is crucial for you who you work with. Your vision does not necessarily make you a pioneer. Many of us believe that when God gives me a vision, uh, it means I am the one that will start the, the uh, 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 the program. No. What God is saying is, your vision may be a part or a support to a vision that he has given to somebody else. Don't be in a eager. Don't, don't, be, don't be eager to be the founder or the president of anything. God is the one that decides what your vision is. And lastly on that, we need to consider what to use. You need to choose very well what to use in accomplishing your task. If you use a wrong item, you will get a wrong result. This choosing what to use may include material resources, open doors and networks, doors of ministry, utterances, and everything. There's a great provision before God grants you a vision. There is a provision for it. So for every assignment, there is a consignment. So don't be in a rush to do things without God. Wait on God, and then he will direct your steps. He will help you. When you look at the story, of, uh, uh, the story of Gideon. God helped Gideon to choose who will go with him to the battle. And you need to allow God to help you choose those that will help you in the vision. In the vision that he has given to you. Lastly and in conclusion, you must avoid virus attack. You must avoid virus. What is a virus? Virus is a, is, is a, is a little organism that creeps into organization or computers and they cause damage. Some viruses are not are dangerous but they give room for other dangerous ones and what do you do you need to use the antivirus remember you don't use the antivirus when the virus has attacked so you need to use the antivirus before the virus attack if you have and the antivirus for for sin is the blood of jesus if you have not accepted jesus as a lord and savior this is the right time for you to do so shall we please bow our heads as we talk to the almighty god father we thank you for this time we pray Lord, that you take all the praise and let your name alone be glorified let your word be a seed in our life and let it bring forth food to your name in jesus name
Church of God, in particular, youth in southwestern part of Nigeria, as well as youth in the Middle East. I want to thank the Lord for our daddy and our mommy in the Lord, the general overseer, and the, our mommy in Israel, daddy and mommy at Deboe, for this platform they have given unto young people globally. To be a blessing to the people of God. I also want to thank God for our leader, uh, the continental overseer for Southwest and uh, Middle East, making up Africa three continent. I thank the Lord for his assistant, our beloved Pastor Boniface Okenwa, as well as the Satku of the youth for African three continent, Pastor Olaguke. It is my prayer that this little word that the Lord Almighty is about to release unto everybody that is watching will be a blessing to you in the name of Jesus. Shall we pray? King of glory, we thank you. We bless you for this commission. We want to thank you for this new thing that you are doing as far as African three continent is concerned. Lord, blow me as your trumpet to bless your people. Even in the next few minutes, as we look at the topic, youth that runs with the vision. King of glory, quicken our mortal body to know that the time is not just there for us to waste. It is said that if you wait, you waste. Our life will not be a waste. Our lives will be a donation and not just a duration that we pass through in life. When this talk will be over, we pray that we will have that confidence to know that we have experienced you. For in Jesus' name, I prayed. Amen. The topic before me says, Youth that runs with vision. And I'm taking my text from the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 2 to 3. And I quickly read. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tablets, that it may run that read at it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. May the Lord bless his word in our lives in Jesus name to run with something is to get something accomplished with speed and when we talk about speed and getting something accomplished urgency with radical commitment and rugged determination are attached what is the thing we are talking about here is vision the question is what is vision Vision is the ability to see something for the future. It's a clear image of how you see the future. Vision is the mental picture held in your mind of some preferred future experiences and developments. It is the dominant picture in a man's heart according to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Vision is what shapes an individual's future. And this is why a man's future is hidden in his vision. Vision is also the preview of one's coming attraction because success has many friends. And this is why it is said that you cannot feature in the future that you cannot picture. If a person lacks vision, it means he lacks a sense of direction to achieve the destiny that God has prepared for him. This means that such an individual has nothing to focus on in his mind about where he's going in life and God's purpose for him. 
Vision involves a change from where a man is presently to where he's supposed to be. According to Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 8, the Bible says better is the end of a thing than the beginning. And this is why a man called Steve Covey says vision is keeping in view always. We should not make a mistake to equate illusion with vision. Illusion is marriage, optical illusion, according to people that study physics. While ambition is what you want to become. Your vision in life is your dream with, with a purpose. Without a purpose, a man's vision does not work. It is the purpose of a mission that motivates an individual to get his future of what God has destined for him to be achieved. Why vision then? Vision gives a man's life focus, a direction. It contains a life of permutation, a life of trial and error, accidental living, and then it contains a life that is left to chances which is otherwise referred to as anything goes. And this is why it is said that if you cannot stand for something, you will fall for anything. And of course, according to one man called Sam Chant, an authority when it comes to leadership, it defines vision as an acronym to be F, stand for first thing first, O, other things second, C, cut out unimportant things, and U, unify behind the vision and s sticking to the vision why vision when vision is written it is crucial to a man achieving success in life according to habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2 and this is why it is said that on the express way of life overtaking is allowed vision functions like a compass on the high sea of life as to how a ship is guided or navigated. Number three, vision gets you confined to your gifts and natural abilities. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 20, which says that let every man abide in the same calling where he, he was called. Therefore, vision fuels passion. Number four, a clearly defined vision we see an individual true when he's faced with difficult times. For example, Joseph sticks to his vision because he was sure that the vision came from God. According to Genesis chapter 39 verse 2 to 9. Permit me to say this. When written in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters. One represents danger and the other represents opportunity. Now, according to John F. Kennedy, vision allows therefore opportunity to be seen even in the face of danger. I can say, according to Carlos Slim Helu, one man who was adjured to be the richest man in the world said, there is prosperity in every adversity. What is vision? Vision gives hope and confidence to see possibility of achieving success even where there seems to be impossibility. According to Romans chapter 5 verse 5, why vision? Vision gives a defined, definite destination. Just like an air ticket and the visa that you carry. Despite stopovers. Joseph knew. Potiphar's house was just a one of the stop, stopovers. Not the final destination. And of course, vision makes an individual unique. Because it is personal, it will make you innovative and creative. And of course, vision brings a visible change in a man's life for the better because there will be no permanent end to a man that is envisioned with great future. And finally, vision protects against waste, wastage of resources and life itself. Efforts and resources are wasted to a visionless course. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about running a with a vision, according to our text. 
That text didn't say, write the vision that he may walk. Who reads it? Neither does he say he wants people to stay. But it says, vision wants people to run. And when we talk about youths that runs with vision, we are talking about God's purpose for an individual's life. And when we want, when we say hey, you should run with a vision, what does it mean? First of all, we mean that an individual should see the picture of what God sees for him in various aspects of his life, which is futuristic of where an individual is going or where he wants to be. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says, For I know the thought that I think towards you, said the Lord, thought of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected hand. Another version says, to give you a future and hope. Another version says, to bring about the future you hope for. What future do you hope for according to God's plan and purpose for your life? For example, in academics, do you want to be like the Hebrew boys according to Daniel chapter 1 verse 20 who after training had 10 times better knowledge than their teachers? Or you want to be like the psalmist Psalm 119 verse 99 who people that had understanding more than their teachers or more than the ancients, according to verse 100, in career or business. Do you want your name to be a household name, brand globally? Ministry-wise or spiritual-wise? The Bible said the deep, call it under the deep. What future do you want? Or does God want for you? So that you have access to mysteries, according to Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. In relationship, do you want your marital life to be a global role model in finance? Do you want to be another or a better than Aliko Dangote or Jeff Boss? We got to differentiate from here ambition from vision. What you want to become is ambition, what God wants you to become is vision. But there is always an inter interesting intersection when your personal will is lost. In God's will, who is your creator? Who has the detailed picture of his of your purpose for creating you in his hand? Then purpose is battered. After all, Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 says, We are created for his pleasure. The question is, how do you know God's will? Check the scripture. You can only picture the future of your life to feature from the scripture. How do you go about it? By studying and meditating from the scripture. It is in the process of meditation that revelation is battered. And when revelation is battered, you get instruction for manifestation. Now, in between revelation and instruction, passion for motivation that creates commitment and determination for manifestation and instruction is received. All of this summarizes running with vision. That is, to be committed to God's calling and purpose for our life with our whole heart. As I close, let's look at the Joseph example. According to Genesis chapter 37 verse 1 to 11. Here is a teenager envisioned with leadership dream over his siblings and parents that attracted jealousy, animosity and hatred to the point of being killed. Nevertheless, he was told into land of slavery. But guess, God stepped into that vision because it is of God. The question is, how did he run with his vision? Four things, and I close. Number one, he dared to dream. Dear, as an acronym means, dangerous alignment to receive, to reveal expectation. Dangerous alignment to reveal expectation. Now, dream, on the other hand, as an acronym means, desired reality expected a manifestation according to Romans chapter 8 verse 19. Despite the fact that Joseph was hated for his dreams his uprightness and the special dress that his father bought for him 
Nevertheless, he had a very big vision. Now, why is it that people don't dream big? It could be as a result of excuses and fear. And if your vision is bigger than you, then you depend on God. People don't dream because of excuses like they are too old, they are too young, or past failures, or they are just coming out of heart, or they are too insignificant, or they are encumbered with too many challenges. Joseph succumbed over all this. His vision was big. The second thing he did is that he defined his vision. Defined as an acronym means desired evidence for intercontinental news explained. It involves four things. He dated it. You must have a specific date to jumpstart that vision. Number two, detail it. That is, list out step by step way in which you are going to achieve your vision. And of course, deadline is your vision must be time bound and then be devoted to it. What do I mean by that? You pray your vision into reality as you run with it. This is why a man called Henry David Torrio said, In the long run, men hit only what they aim at. So, therefore, date your vision, detail it, deadline it, and be devotedly. I mean, be devoted to pray it through. Number three thing that Joseph did. He declared his dream. What do I mean by this? This simply means he had a mission statement of his life manifesto for that vision. He declared unto his, unto his siblings and his parents. He told them his vision, what it's all about. Mind you, Make sure you, you don't share your vision with everybody. But what we are communicating here is that communicate your vision to a supporting system of like-minded people that will help you because you can't succeed alone in life. You need destiny helpers. He, at least he had a destiny helper in the prison when he interpreted the dreams of the chief butler. It was that same man who helped him. Though after two years, he didn't remember. But the day he remembered, he told the king, when the king was, when the king did not understand the dream he had, and that paved the way for him, he gave him access for his dream to be fulfilled. There are some good fools who will encourage you as your team people who will evaluate, emulate, and elevate your dream, your vision. And finally, you have to defend your dream. Joseph defended his dream. A man said, if a man does not have anything to die for, he's not fit to live. Joseph had to defend his, his, his dream, his vision. Excuse me. As powerful as a vision may be, you must not quit even when you have challenges. One way through which Joseph defended his, his vision is through fighting unbelief with faith. Genesis 37, 1 to 11. He overcome adversity with perseverance. Genesis 37, 12 to 36. He beat temptation with integrity. Genesis 39. He resists resentment with forgiveness, Genesis 40 to 41. He conquered self-absorption with influence. As I close, there are seven, eight vision killers. If you want to run with the vision and accomplish it, that you must pay attention to and be careful. I list them and then I'll pray. Number one, there are people who want to distract you. They want to shift your focus like his brother's. Paul said, one thing I do, forgetting other things. And of course, number two, there are people that want to disregard your vision. They want to belittle your vision. Number three, there are people who want to cause a delay in the vision, in your vision from being fulfilled. They want to slow you down with sin. Potty five wives is an example. Number four, beware of people that want to disappoint you and weaken your will. 
butler at a point was like that. Number five, beware of people that want to devalue you and you what you represent. They want to take you for granted. Number six, beware of people that may want to cause division between you and your destiny helpers. And of course, number seven, beware of people that want to disrespect you. They want to look down on you. And finally, beware of people that want to deceive you with deliberate wrong cancer. As I close, Paul said, I press on that I may hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. He said, I press towards the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Has God called you with a vision to run? Please, like Paul admonished Timothy, he said, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. It is my prayer that even in this pandemic season, full of struggles and restrictions, never forget that God has called you for this specific time in history. He will help you to keep running if you look unto him. Let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. God's plan for you is of good and not of evil. He has a plan for you, a purpose for you, a dream and a vision for your life. So make the rest of your life the best of your life from now. I close finally with this quotation from Helen Keller who said, the most pathetic person in the world is someone who has sight but has no vision. Dear to dream. Ask God to give you a God-sized dream of vision for your faith, for your marriage, for your children, for your finances, for your business, for your career and character. The Lord God will help you. He helped our Father in the Lord. He has helped me. He has helped our beloved leader, Daddy Odeshola. He will help you. You will succeed. You will make it. In the name of Jesus. Your vision will not be abruptly come to an end. Even in the middle of fulfillment. In the name of Jesus. I will see you at the top. In Jesus name. I wish you a happy youth convention. The first of his kind. May the Lord make you number one. In your community, in your family, around you. In Jesus' name. Shalom.
I'd like to thank God for this privilege and opportunity of being part of the Youth Convention for the Continental Youth Convention for Africa Continent 3. And it's my prayer as we connect with this great convention with the theme, Write the Vision. God's plan and purpose for each and every one of our lives shall be made manifest in the name of Jesus. May we kindly pray. For you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. For you were great. You do miracles ever so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you father there's none as great as mind as wonderful as faithful as you thank you dad for beautiful time for us to connect together to hear your word thank you dad for this continental youth convention we ask oh lord as your sons and daughters connect with the continental youth convention as they listen to each speaker they shall receive that we shall launch them onto greater heights fulfilling vision and purpose in the name of jesus i ask O oh lord as your word goes forth you speak and let every heart be blessed in jesus name we pray amen beloved as you are all aware the theme of the convention is write the vision write the vision and I'll take us to, where is the obvious text? Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. And Habakkuk says, I will stand at my watch and station myself. And I'm reading from the NIV version. Or let's, from the, let's take a New Living Translation. New Living Translation, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There, I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. Then the Lord said to me, write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently for it will surely take place it will not be delayed the king james version of verse 2 says write the vision and make it plain niv version says write down the revelation and make it plain you see in life so many people are complaining they complain about so many things and here was habakkuk complaining and presenting his complaints to god and he's waiting for God to speak. And the Lord says, okay, I'm going to speak to you. Come on, write what I'm going to tell you. Write whatever my answer is. Write your role towards my complaint. And you see, one thing I realized, when God gives a word, the word is a lamp. The word guides us. Psalm 119 verse 105, Psalm 119 verse 105, the word guides guides us it guides us it gives light to our path so that we are no longer in darkness and that is what god's word is when god gives us a vision is to give us a guide you see we'll often hear it said that a vision is a picture of the preferred future is a perception of a preferred future seeing further than your eyes can see vision is always about the future seeing the invisible and believing it is possible that is vision i see from this scripture one thing i realize is a vision is god's answer to you on your role towards solving your complaint god answers you and tells you your role your functionality towards a complaint towards a problem that exists that is the vision. You may ask, why do we need a vision? Because the word of God is clear. 
in Proverbs 29 18 Proverbs 29 18 where there's no vision the people perish but happy is the person that connects with that vision why do you need a vision seven things very quickly so your life can have direction your life can have direction Psalm 32 verse 8 Psalm 32 verse 8 I will instruct thee and teach you in the way you will go your life will have direction when you have a vision you need a vision why in the second instance so your lifestyle can be disciplined your lifestyle can be a disciplined lifestyle um paul said in first corinthians 9 27 first corinthians 9 27 i pummel my flesh and put it under subjection lest after preaching to others i myself be a castaway many lives are indisciplined they lack control why no vision in the third instance you need a vision so your legacy can be a distinguished one you see it's important that you focus and on leaving a legacy in life i've often told us that the legacy is that which is inspiring impacting irrefutable undeniable unforgettable that is a legacy your legacy can be distinguished when you have a vision and the word of god tells us in proverbs 13 22 proverbs 13 22 a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children psalm 145 verse 4 psalm 145 verse 4 says one generation after the other shall speak of thy works to each other that is legacy but you must have a vision so you could have a distinguished legacy and and i and too many times people just want to live life they are not focused on having a legacy why they lack vision in the fourth instance you need a vision so you can link with destiny you can link without god's plan for your life jeremiah 29 11 jeremiah 29 11 for i know the thoughts i think towards you thoughts of good and not of evil to give unto you an expected end you need to link with destiny how by having a vision let god speak to you about his plans for your life in the fifth instance you need a vision so you can lead with discernment the word of god makes it clear Matthew 15 14 Matthew 15 14 when the blind blind lead the blind they fall into a ditch so when one lacks vision they are just moving on lacking discernment not understanding the times not understanding what to do they lack discernment you need vision so you can lead you can influence with discernment having a proper understanding of the times Beloved, in the sixth instance, you need vision so you can leap over disappointments in life. There will be disappointments. But you see, when you have a vision of where you're going to, as a disappointment comes, you leap over the disappointments because you have a vision. And the Bible tells us in Isaiah 40, verse 29 to 31, Isaiah 40, 29 to 31, God gives power to the faint. Those that have no mind, he increases their strength. The youth may faint, the youth may fall, they may be weary. But when you wait upon the Lord, you connect with God's vision. The Lord, Bible, Bible tells us that the Lord himself shall renew your strength. You shall mount on wings like eagles. You are able to soar. You are able to fly over disappointments. Like Joseph, no matter the disappointment, appointments you have a vision you are leaping over the disappointments why you have a vision when you have a vision beloved brethren you're able to leverage on your deployments in life you're able to leverage on every opportunity every diploma every every position god gives you many people waste their opportunities in life they waste opportunities not understanding that God had allowed them to be there for a time like this. Where you are is not an error. It may not be what you're planning, but God has allowed you to be there because it's a stepping stone to your greatness. You must have a vision. He positions you for a purpose. And so when in Isaiah 48, 17, Isaiah 48, 17, the Lord says, I am thy God, which teaches you how to profit. And I am leading you. I am leading you along the way you should go. 
You need to just have a vision so you could leverage on every deployment, every, every opportunity you have in life. Let me very quickly list some hindrances to people fulfilling vision. Darkness. In other words, people are not aware of the fact that God even has a, a plan for them. How Hosea 4, 6, people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, 6. In the second instance, some even disregard the vision. They ignore it. They know God has a plan, but they ignore it. Number three, some doubt the vision. They disbelieve it. Gideon initially disbelieved God's plan for his life. Thank God he connected with God's plan. It was then he became great in life. Number four, distraction. Some are distracted by challenges, distracted by friends. Distraction is an enemy to your fulfilling vision. Ask yourself, are you being distracted right now? Number five, discouragement. Discouragement. And at a point in time, Elijah even gave way to discouragement. It's not a question of the title you have. The issue, brethren, is are you allowing yourself to be discouraged? Be strong and of good courage. Jeremiah was telling the Lord, I can't speak. I can't speak. And the Lord said, hey, don't say you can't speak. Don't discourage yourself. Too many times we discourage ourselves. Jeremiah 1, 5 to 8. Jeremiah 1, 5 to 8. Number six, delay. Delay. But the Bible tells me in Habakkuk 2, 3, Habakkuk 2, 3, the vision is for an appointed time. It may tarry, but don't bother, brethren. Don't worry, brethren. It will come. It will come. It will come. In the seventh instance, some people are dull and they are lazy. Proverbs 24, 30 to 34. Proverbs 24, 30 to 34. Tells us that when you get to the field, the lifestyle of those that are dull is just full of thorns. They sleep, they slumber. Poverty comes forth because they are dull. Number eight, difficulties. And some at times people give room to difficulties, not understanding that the Lord says you can do all things through Christ which strengthens you. Number nine, detractors. And when I think of Nehemiah, Nehemiah experienced detractors. He had a vision. They were detractors. But do not, Nehemiah was clear. In Nehemiah chapter 2, if you read 18 to 20, Nehemiah chapter 2, 18 to 20, Nehemiah said, look, we are going to arise and build. Even though the Sambalats and Tobias came, Nehemiah said, look, God will prosper us. He is the author of this vision. He is the author of this assignment. He is the author of what I am doing. God will prosper us. Beloved brethren, I want you to realize that once you connect, with whoever had given you the vision, the Almighty God. Once you connect with the Almighty God, no matter the challenges that come, connect with Him. God will prosper you in the name of Jesus. And I want someone to shout, God will prosper me. And say again, God will prosper me. I will fulfill the vision. And if you believe that, shout a mega amen. It's my prayer that no matter the hindrances to your fulfilling vision, by the power of God's word, you shall overcome, you shall overcome, you shall overcome those hindrances in the name of Jesus. So we now ask ourselves, how do we get a vision? And I'll just share two quick things. Number one, you listen. Habakkuk said, I will stand and I will wait to see. There was intentionality. Listening intentionally. Intentionally. Listening to what? Number one, you listen to God. God, what is it you want me to do? Listen to God. Number two, you are listening to your gifts. I have gifts within me. What are these gifts telling me? Number three, you listen to your grievances. To grievances. Nehemiah heard of grievances. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down. We read Nehemiah chapter one. The walls are broken down. The walls. He listened to those grievances and he realized that God wanted him to do something about it. Stop murmuring and complaining. Ask yourself, what does God want me to do about it? So you listen to God. You listen to your giftings. You listen to your grievances. How do you get a vision? In the second instance, 
you look. Nehemiah, I mean, Habakkuk listened and he looked. What do you look at? You look at, your, at the problems around you. Those problems around you are there. And you've been positioned for those, to see those problems. Why? Because you have a role in solving them. As you look at your problems, you now look at the potentials God has deposited inside you. They are not to be wasted. And then you look at your passion. But see, what we are talking about in this convention is writing the vision. You see, by the time you are able to understand what a vision is and the, 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 the hindrances, you understand how to get a vision, the solution is writing the vision. And God gave it as a commandment. He said, write the vision. Write the revelation. Write my answer when we are talking about writing writers will tell you that those that write have creativity and when god says write he says create from your own thoughts imaginations from what i'm going to tell you create and put forth something i realize certain things about writings brethren Whenever you're writing a vision, whenever you're writing what God tells you, it must be concise. Just a few words. Summarize what God has told you. The assignment God has given to you. Summarize it. It must be concise. Why do you write it in the second instance? So there could be clarity. So many things are muddled up in your mind. You have so many things. But do you realize that when you write things down, it, get, it becomes clearer to you. So have you written down the assignment in life? Have you written down what God has told you for the next few years? Have you written it down? It's must, it's, there's clarity. You see, without clarity, your picture loses its beauty. Don't think it, write it. When you write something down, it enhances your commitment. It keeps the vision alive through the challenges. You remain more committed. I'm sure when you go to banking halls in Nigeria, for instance, you see the vision. You go to companies, you see the vision so that people can be committed to the vision. It keeps the vision alive. When you write the vision, it helps you to be consistent. James 1, 8, James 1, it says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. But when you have a vision, even when you're trying to divert, I mean, swear from it, you look at that vision, it helps you to be consistent. You know the path you're running towards. Why? You've written the vision. We often will tell students, write the kind of grades you want. Write the kind of grace you want. So when you could see it, you could be committed to it. Write the goals you want to achieve by the end of this year. So when you see it, you can be committed to it. Write. So even though challenges are coming, you can be committed to it. In redeemed parishes, we have the vision statement. So we could be committed to it. You write so you can concentrate, concentrate, concentrate. Removing distractions. Because there will be distractions. You write so you can communicate that vision to others. Show it to others. Let others understand what Bible says. They that see it shall run with it. So you write that vision. This is what I'm trusting God. I will achieve. This is what I believe God wants me to fulfill. Others will see it and say, wow, I'm ready to support you. I'm ready to see you through. It is communicated to others. Others in the next thing that can connect, can connect, can connect with it. People can be captivated by it. Write the vision. And so we ask ourselves, brethren, the dream, what God has told you, have you really written it down? Are you just thinking about it? Have you written it down? Concise, clarity, commitment. 
consistency helps you to concentrate helps you to communicate to others helps you to help others to connect 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 to your dreams and be captivated and help join you and support you in the old vision but as i round up we ask ourselves what do you do with the written vision number one place it where you can see it place it you see you should have what is referred to as a vision board a vision board is a board it can either be digital or there in your room my daughter once told me how she had a vision board in her in her room and she had pictures there she had quotations she had statements that will encourage her to where she what she wanted to fulfill in life and the pictures will remind of the kind of house she wanted to build the quotations will remind of what she wanted to achieve have a vision board place it what do you do with the vision you place it where you can see it you visualize so when you see you're visualizing it you see battles are won or lost in the mind so you should be able to arrest your mind with the picture your mind has and so when the lord told habakkuk write the vision make it plain have a vision board I saw a boy and in his computer as you opened it there's first page so I'm, i saw a private jet i said what's this private jet for he said that's my vision i want to own a private jet he said so whenever i see it i am telling god this is what i want to, for the kind of corporation i shall have i need a private jet that was his vision so brethren place that written statement those pictures uh, in your phone in your place it in your room someone told me that in his bathroom on the door he will place he will, the, some pictures there whenever he's sitting down in the restroom every morning he'll be looking at the vision and so each morning he looks at it and says, this is what i want to achieve in life number two you pray about it somebody once said prayer is giving god permission to interfere in the affairs of men prayer is saying god please go ahead and interfere lord i need your help and james 5 16 james 5 16 says the effectual fervent man prayer of the righteous availeth much the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much so when you place that vision where it is in whatever form it is digital or whatever you begin to pray about it you pray committing it to god believing that god who had placed that picture in your heart he will help you to fulfill it in the third instance you begin to proclaim it you see words have creative ability so when people will often say short mouth is a short destiny don't keep quiet begin to proclaim it by the grace of god i will be this i am trusting god this will happen ah you begin to prophesy proclaim it to yourself proclaim it and declare it. you wake up but you are trusting god for it so you begin to proclaim it the lord tells us in numbers 14 28 numbers 14 28 as you have spoken in my ears so will i do to you create your future by your confessions create your future by your confessions be particular about what you confess about so begin to proclaim what you've written begin to proclaim proclaim it brethren in the fourth instance as you're proclaiming it you plan for it somebody once said a goal without a plan is only a wish a goal without a plan is only a wish you see you don't just plan your work but you also work your plan you plan your work and then you work your plan that's what's written in proverbs 21 5 the new living translation version proverbs 21 5 good planning and hard work leads to prosperity good planning 
hard work you plan your work and then you work your plan it's not just planning but you need to work your plan so brother you need to plan for it you write it you plan for it whatever the vision is you plan for it when the lord told me hey son start a school yes i do recall one place if there one began to pray about it one began to confess it by the grace of god one will have a secondary school a boarding school i mean i, I saw it happening where you can begin to plan you as an engineer i do know that any building that comes out comes out with a plan and finally you pursue it you begin to pursue the plan philippians 3 13 to 14 philippians 3 13 to 14 i don't count myself to have a prayer angel, but this one thing i do forgetting those things which are behind forgetting the past experiences forgetting what people have said i press towards the i i i i i i I reach forth unto those things which are before and press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling and pressing towards my vision. Beloved, that's what God wants us to do. But see, it's God that has given you that vision. You need Him who is the author of the vision. You need Him to carry you through. You need Him to continue to speak to you. You need Him to strengthen you. But you know what God says in Isaiah 59? He says his hands are not shortened He's as if he can't save. But he says when you disconnect from him, when you give room for, with iniquities, the Lord will say, oh, you're on your own. He separates himself from you. When you just give room to that which displeases him, iniquities. So begin to ask yourself, is there a possibility that you're giving room to that which doesn't glorify God? And so Deuteronomy 29 verse 4 becomes your portion. Deuteronomy 29 verse 4. You have a, the Lord does not give you a heart to perceive. Eyes to see and ears to hear. Your heart is not able to perceive God's will. Your eyes is not able to see where God wants you to go to. Your ears can't hear God's word. Why? There's a disconnection. I want to urge you, beloved brethren, as we continue with this youth convention, determine that whatever will bring a disconnection between you and God be uprooted in the name of Jesus. Determine more than ever that as the Lord by his mercy connects with you and speaks to you, you shall write that vision. You shall run and place it. You shall begin to pray about it. You shall plan. You shall pursue it. You can't do it on your own. You need God to help you. Thus I want to urge you all, beloved brethren, why don't you just ask God to help you? Your life shall not be a wasted life. Your life shall be a life of legacy. The time is not tomorrow. The time is now. May we kindly rise. And why don't you just speak to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't want my life to be a waste. I want to fulfill your plan for my life. Open my eyes, open my eyes to see, open my ears to hear. Let me have a heart that will perceive your plan, your vision, your purpose for me in a time like this. Strengthen me, O oh Lord, not just to write a vision, but to run with that vision. In any way I have failed you, I am sorry. I repent of my faults. I ask that you have mercy upon me. And that is that's our prayer this thing. As your sons and daughters connect with you. Lord, they will have ears that shall hear you. A heart that shall perceive. Eyes that shall see. That they shall begin to understand that vision, the plan you have for them. And they shall begin to run with that vision. Thank you, Father. Blessed be thy name. Hosanna be unto thee in the highest. In Jesus' glorious name, we pray. Beloved, I'd like to congratulate you. I'd like to congratulate you on being part of this convention. I'd like to congratulate you on connecting with greatness. And it's my prayer as this convention continues, by his grace and by his mercy, your life shall bring forth celebration. Even before this time next month, you shall begin to celebrate a new level in the name of Jesus. God bless you. Hallelujah. With Jesus' joy, I bring this uh, uh, Father's blessing 
and to usher us into uh, this very modern edition of um, the African Three Continental Youth Convention. And um, the team is write the vision down. And um, of course, the text is from uh, Habakkuk 2, uh, verses 3 and 4. And um, let me begin by congratulating uh, the youths, both the youths by age and uh, the youths in heart or at heart, whichever, that's okay, in this continent and all the admirers of the youth of this continent. On the occasion again of this Median um, Continental Youth Convention. Uh, my job is very easy <laughs> and very simple too. And um, it's just for about 10 minutes. And now, um, by very, very brief admonition, is uh, a short story. A very short story of a lesson that I learned from my late biological father, uh, Martin Sudezo Kemwa. That's by the way, anyway. And to the glory of God, he had gone to be with the Lord almost uh, four years ago. Praise God. Uh, it's my prayer that we will end well. And um, whether by rapture or when our days are fulfilled, that we will also go to be with the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Now, this, this, this story, incidentally, which is my brief admonition before we pray, uh, I, I learned it um, when I was about 36 years. Uh, the, 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 the very same year that God promoted me to uh, the position of a state pastor in the Redeemed Christian Church of God. That is in 1999. Uh, we don't use that nomenclature again because the church had expanded. And um, within a state, you can have <laughs> up to 10 uh, provinces now. That's about 22 years ago. Now, the, the story goes to us. In that 1999, uh, my father visited with my wife and I, and uh, because since we got married in 1996, he had not visited us. Now, he came to observe and to make sure that we were living well as young couples. Now, after four days of his observation and uh, spending time with us, um, he called me into his room and gave me some words of advice. After which he told me that he will be going back in the next two days. Now, I will mention just two of the counsels or wise counsel that he gave me as a youth, just like uh, you. <laughs> and number one, he advised me that I should get a maid for my wife so that she would not overlevel herself with domestic works. And uh, my wife, wisely enough, literally spoiled him with hospitality. You know, imagine a woman from another culture, you know, I married from a different culture, uh, from mine, another tribe in my country. Now, she, she so much treated my father hospitably that my father was delighted. And I know him a little bit. He's a very disciplined and principled man who it takes a lot to, to tickle. But this girl met his, 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 his satisfaction in terms of hospitality. Praise God for good wives. Now, number two, my father advised me, that's where we're going. The other one is just a, a prelude. Now, 
Number two, he said, in his own word, and I quote, this your leader, that is the General Basia, is not a human being. Now, I was keenly listening for him to decode the proverb <laughs> for me, as usual, because uh, he talked a lot in proverbs. Yes. If he doesn't want you to fight when you finish eating, he will tell you when you finish eating, climb the fence and tell the neighbors that you use palm oil and uh, pepper to eat yam and not with stew. Now he's telling you, if you quarrel over food when I come back, ah, you're going to, you're going to receive some disciplinary uh, can, you know. Then he said, how could he, this your leader is not a human being, remember that's what he said, number two. He said, how could he have all these people and yet his head will still be level? That is, his head will still be humble. He marveled. Now he was referring to the crowd he saw at the Holy Ghost Congress of 1999 because um, he he visited the presidential camp with us. He came within that period. Now, from that day that my father attended the 1999 Congress, he became a secret disciple of Jesus Christ under Pastor De Boye. Praise God. But why, why this story? Why did I tell this story? Now, I want you to listen. No amount of preaching brought my father's interest into Pentecostalism. No. But an observed life of through humility and simplicity that he saw in the life of our father in the Lord, Pastor Yair the Boy, started the eternal journey of his conviction and salvation into being a born again Christian. And I, I, I tell you, he made heaven. Hallelujah. God had shown me clearly that he made heaven. Glory be to God. It's my prayer that we will also end well. Now, in conclusion, before I pray for you, dear youth and young adults, the word of God counsels us that it is not good to have zeal without knowledge. Proverbs 19 verse 2. It's not good to have zeal without knowledge. Knowledge is good. Zeal is good. But there should be a blending. There should be a meeting point of knowledge and zeal. Therefore, we should write it down, both on the paper and on the spiritual tablet of our hearts, that humility is the limiting spice of God's kingdom. Humility is the limiting spice. Remember the team is write the vision down. So I wanted to write it down. It should be the foundation of everything we do. Humility. It was humility and simplicity my father saw once. He saw the man once. The other times he, he saw him on television afterwards. But once physically saw this man of God. The general president didn't know that somebody like that was in the congregation. There were, there were tens and hundreds of thousands of people. But my father observed humility and simplicity. That's all. From that day, he became a secret disciple of Jesus Christ and a follower of the God that Pastor Deboya humbly followed. Now, without this threat of humility, you cannot live the kingdom life. The word of God says in Matthew 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in Matthew 18, verses 3 and 4, Matthew 18, 3 and 4, the word of God commands us to humbly simplify our lives like little children so that we can enter in the now and in the now after of eternity into the kingdom of heaven. And James chapter 4, finally, verse 10, cancels us to humble ourselves in the sight of God so that he will lift us up in due season. May God lift us up. But first, we have a responsibility to humble ourselves.
So let us spice our conduct with humility so that God can lift us up in different areas of our lives where we are down, especially as youth. May the Holy Spirit graciously explain and expand these words in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Shall we pray? Gracious Father, thank you for your mercies. The grace to walk with you and before you in through humility and simplicity, even as youth, my Father, give to us in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Once again, I say congratulations. God bless you. Let somebody shout a big hallelujah. What a word. What a conference. What a convention. We want to thank God for what he has done during this awesome moment. This is the first day of our conference, of our convention, and it has come in this form. I think somebody should shout another bigger hallelujah. We want to give our thanksgiving offering and our offering to the Almighty God just to thank Him for what He has done during the first day. And I trust God uh, tomorrow will be far, far greater. In the book of Luke chapter 6, verse 38, the Bible says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good mail, press down, and shaking together, and run you over. Shall men give into your bosom? For with the same measure that ye met, whether it shall be measured to you again. When you give, it comes back to you in several fruit. And in our kingdom, the kingdom of God, we give gifts to the king of kings and the lords of lords. And when you give a gift to a king, when you go to a king and you take a gift along, you give to him. It will not allow you to go back empty-handed. You remember the story of the Magi and the Bible when they came to Jesus. They are also king in their own right. That's why the Bible said they are wise men. So king of kings is ready to bless us. It's an opportunity to give to the king of kings so that we can receive his blessing. And I trust God as we give bountifully tonight, the almighty God will bless us bountifully in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. The account details to post your offering and your thanksgiving will be relayed on the screen and the choir will be ministry at the background. The Lord bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for giving us the opportunity to give our offerings to you. We ask that you bless this offering and you bless us in return. We ask that everyone who gives to you, they will receive blessings that money cannot buy, and they will also receive blessings that money can buy. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Let somebody shout another bigger hallelujah.
adoration for what he has done today. The one of the Continental Youth Conversion is a huge success. May the name of the Lord be praised. Somebody shout hallelujah. We want to return all the glory, all the honor, all the praises, all the adoration to the Almighty God for what he has done today. For, for honoring us with his presence. Indeed, the word of the Lord that says in the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy as fully expressed himself itself in our midst today. 
There is tremendous joy in the atmosphere as a result of what God has done in our life. The talk show was impactful. The song ministration was wonderful. The world was so lifting and full of encouragement. Indeed, the vision is clearer and we have written it down clearly. We want to use this opportunity to appreciate all the verses that God has used today to bring his word to our life, to make the vision clearer and brighter unto us. We pray that the blessings that God has used them to release upon the life of all the viewers and listeners today will be permanent in the mighty name of Jesus. And my prayer for you is that your blessing will remain permanent forever and ever in the mighty name of Jesus. People of God, this is just the day one. God is set to do greater things. As the scriptures say, the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former. What God is going to do tomorrow for sure it will be greater than what you have experienced today. So I want to encourage you to put your house in order. Reschedule your, your, your plans for tomorrow and make sure you are in this program. Share this link. Invite your friends. Share the flyer. Tell them that something is happening in African three continent that God is moving in a special way. And as you come, the Lord will bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. We'll be receiving the word from our fathers in the Lord. We'll be receiving some ministration and a lot of activity that will transform your life forever. As you come, your blessing will be permanent in Jesus' mighty name. See you tomorrow.